Ah, now we can't hear you, actually. John, we can't hear you. I thought it was just a sort of silence contest, but actually something didn't work out. No, still nothing. Which is interesting because we were just backstage a second ago and we were fine. Still nothing. Yeah. He will relog apparently. Uh, of course, guys, this will be a stream for Vavrinka Jari, and John will actually like be watching, you know, in Buenos Aires where he is right now. However, uh, still, uh, just before the the match itself is about is going to begin, we're gonna just sit here and talk about whatever. I honestly have no idea what John wants to talk about, but you know, we'll see. But um, yeah, just before we started this live stream, we actually just um, sort of you know started talking backstage, and the mic was working fine. So I have no idea what happened, but uh, hopefully he's going to be here in a second. And if not, we'll just watch Jari Wawrinka. <laughs> you know, whatever happens, we'll be, we'll be fine. And um, you can see in the title that this is a live watch along from Buenos Aires. <laughs> I don't know why it's titled like that. I'm definitely not in Buenos Aires. However, John will be. So um, hopefully he can still tune in in a second. But uh, for now... Uh, let's just sort of uh, maybe, I don't know, because I, I, should I start already talking about the matchup? Am I expecting him not to come uh, back? I guess I guess I'm not. So Wawrinka Jari, of course, is second round in Buenos Aires. Jari, his first match because he is a top four seed at, at the 250. Uh, they actually played once in 2019 in Doha on a hard court and Wawrinka won. Of course, with Stan, you know, every single year matters quite a lot. So it's been uh, it's been a while, and obviously with him, like yeah, just every year changes a lot in terms of his physical decline. So I wouldn't really look at that much, uh, you know. Also, Jari is probably better than he was back then, especially on hard courts. But now, of course, we're playing on clay, so again, this match doesn't really have any relevance. And John is coming back. Can we hear him? We uh, can I hear. Think him. I, I can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Oh, great. Did I interrupt you and in all sorts of awkward TV moments just before? No, no, it was actually fine. I was like sort of ending a sentence. So that was lucky then. That was very lucky. Hey, listen, uh, what did you make of that Sarundolo performance, by the way? Uh, you know, that's been his golden swing so far. He was pretty awful in Cordoba as well. And um, I mean, with Fran, it, it's kind of like that, right? He goes like three or four months being kind of unserious, and then he'll still find his peaks throughout the year. I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident when it comes to I'm that. You didn't think yeah. there was an issue? You didn't think there was a problem? I mean, it seemed a very sloppy first set, and then it got even worse in the second. That's how he played in Cordoba as well. <laughs> against Munar, I think it was okay. that he lost to in the what was it, second round or quarters? I actually don't remember, but but yeah, that's how he played in Cordoba as well. That's that's how he started the season, you know. In uh, in at the Australian Open, obviously he lost two sets to Dane Sweeney as well. He lost to Alexandre Miller, I think like six one six one or something like that in Auckland. Yeah, okay. I mean that's that's been a pretty horrific start. He's actually played four to fifties already. And he's lost as a top four seed, so starting from the second round every single time. Uh -huh. But he, he won a match at the Australian Open, and of course, he also won a match in Davis Cup. But his Davis Cup performances weren't amazing either. He lost to Scott of there. He's like two and six. So it was kind of, you know, just like his beginning of the year. There's a little bit of a breeze for the first time uh, since I arrived about lunchtime today, like about 12 hours ago or a bit less. Uh, which is uh, a little bit dangerous because my phone is looking a bit wonky. So if suddenly, if you see the, if you see the camera just collapse to the floor, uh, it's just because there's a bit of a breeze and it's decided to blow my camera over. But anyway, Nicholas Jarry against Stan Wawrinka. I see it as a 60-40 um, in favour of the Chilean. I know Jarry's form has plummeted in the last few months uh, since the Asian swing, it feels like. But... I don't know. I just think that he'll he can summon some of the stuff that happened to him a year ago, and I think Stan. What was it? Three sets in the previous round? Was it Stan one? Yeah, he won in three sets, but the last two were very, very comfortable. After the losing the opener, he didn't go down as he usually does. Like recently, physically, he actually managed to emerge sort of as the better player, you know, quality wise and. Physically, I guess it, it never really got to that. Uh, 
uh, I don't know. For me, it's pretty close. I don't know if Jari plummeted really. I think he's still pretty much, you know, solid, if not if unspectacular. Definitely not as good as the you know last year's Golden Swing, but we'll see how he does here. Last year, the Golden Swing, he actually was uh, in the qualifying here, right? And he lost to Marigani Alves, I think, in the opening round. So oh, wow. uh, it, it was kind of Rio that kick-started it. He was still outside the top 100. So it is pretty wild, of course, to, to, to sort of think about that. He's also looking for his 100th tour level win. I don't know if this is a stat that matters to us at all, but <laughs> you know, it matters to the ATP. Uh, he would be the eighth Chilean to do so. Uh, one other active, of course, is Christian Garin. And the actually the, the Chilean player with the most wins at tour, on tour level is actually the uh, God, God, uh, grand, uh, grandfather of uh, Nicolas Jari, of course, Jaime Filo. So um, I guess it's a story, you know, of sorts. I don't know if he'll okay. get there because Wawrinka is definitely a threat. And uh, yeah, I'm excited for it. It's going to be a bit of a serving contest, I feel. Oh, really? You think that Stan yeah. serve can, can hold up to that contest? Oh, yeah. I mean, Stan's serve is awesome. And that's like the, the only thing that hasn't declined about his game. <laughs> um, I saw Stan warming up today. I mean, it was a very light session, let's say, with uh, Magnus Norman uh, on the other side of the net. And as I saw Magnus practicing with him, I thought, oh, I've got Magnus's email address. So I decided to email him whilst, whilst he's warming Stan up, so to speak. And uh, 20 minutes later, he emailed me back. Um, and we will probably get an interview with Magnus tomorrow, of course, if Stan wins. So uh, impartiality might be out the window as I, as I watch this match, bearing in mind uh, uh, that potential interview, because I think that could be quite cool. Uh, I see Ghosty writing something about Felix, LOL, in the chat. I know he doesn't like Felix, and I, if I'm right, did he lose? And he lost to Rublev, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, cool. of course. He so came he super got... close, you know. Uh, today, got... if, 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 if anything, today is a positive day for Felix to me. Yeah. Did he have some match points, though? I don't think so. I think it was both oh, okay. Rublev in the... both. You know, it was 8-6 in the second set tiebreak, but I think both set points were Rublev. Oh, he had a match point in the second, in the third set. I was only, I was only following the second, honestly. After that, I was just I, like, yeah, I don't really care about might, this one anymore. He might have had a match point. Yes, it looks like someone's saying so in the chat anyway. Oh uh, yeah, I'm three lo match points actually. Love. Oh wow, love forty on uh, on return. Oh uh, wow. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't see that. Okay, that that definitely sort of changes the landscape there. And, He's probably not as positive. <laughs> no, probably not right now. Well, not yeah, right now. But he did come very close. Yeah, I, I only saw um, the second set and then I then I switched off. I didn't care about this much whatsoever. Anyway, I was traveling this morning, stroke lunchtime, and I'm just wondering what I've missed today. Oh no, I did catch the end or the second set in the the second and third set. Now I think about actually in the Lajovic match. And Lajovic was, well, I don't know what happened to him in the second set. He just seemed to just not, I mean, at 1.41 1 down, he just seemed to check out for the last couple of games. But then he soon checked back in again. And uh, yeah, he was a deserved winner. Uh, he didn't come to press, which is a bit of a disappointment, especially as I thought I might get an English press conference. Uh, it seems like all the Argentinians are told you have to come to press and all the non-Argentinians are told do whatever you like. Um, so uh, we'll see. It's, but it's common at these events for sure. I <laughs> mean. Yeah. By the way, it looks like the players are about to start, so I'm going to disappear, and uh, you might get vanched at some point. You, I might get vanched. Okay. You might get vanched. <laughs> uh, I'll speak to you soon. Is that a good thing? It's probably a good thing. Um, the curse of Lever Cup ghosty? What the hell are you talking about? Did Felix have some insane performance at the Lever Cup? I mean... He did beat Djokovic, but after that, he, he had a ridiculous streak, you know. I, I don't think it was it was the Lever Cup that was the most important part of that uh, patch of play. But anyway, we are, of course, going to be watching Jari Favrinka. I think they're just starting up. I haven't put on the stream yet. I was listening to John Silk, watching John Silk, you know, from, from Buenos Aires for the very first time, so... I, I kind of got lost there, but yeah, they, they are actually starting Stan to serve and he won the first point and it will probably take me two or three before I uh, lock up my stream. 
Ah, that Liver Cup, 2023, you mean, not 2022. Yeah, uh, th that th that was a weird discussion. I mean, I think both guys were somewhat right. Like, they, they just had very different expectations from the event. Because on the one hand, they really they are really sort of like pushing that, you know, very competitive vibe to it, which kind of, for me at least, it kind of has to be there for the event to survive. I still don't get that vibe, though. Like, I still don't, because it's Europe against the rest of the world. Like, why would I care? Because I'm European, I'm supposed to care about the European team? No, I don't give a bloody clue. Uh, you know, I don't give a damn. But like, clue what the hell I'm talking about? I don't know. Anyway, um, what I what I meant is that I get what Felix meant, but at the same time, Monfils was also very right that like you know he's ranked 130 in the world. He's not invited, therefore, his quality is invited. Therefore, the sh for the show, you know, for the um, showboating and for the sort of entertainment value. So I don't know, but it was it was definitely quite funny that uh, they have this dispute. And it is a very meaningless and worthless event. Not meaningless in terms of money, definitely not worthless in terms of money, definitely not. But in terms of you know what it means to me and what it means to the professional landscape of tennis, it definitely is meaningless and worthless. Ugh. But well, Stan Favrinka just missed a complete seater. However, it is still 30-15. Nicolas Jari finding some uh, sort of strong point on return for the first time here. Pavrinka having to loop the ball back here and Jari just crushing it. Uh, we'll see, yeah. I mean, Jari last year, of course, at the Golden Swing, he was like absolutely peaking in terms of his pace and game. What's that sound that I'm hearing right now? Is that is that coming from? Okay, it is coming from uh, John. I just muted him. Then, unless he wants to speak, then he will unmute himself. I hope I hope so, but I don't think he was realizing that. Ghosty says he's Team World, and you actually care if you know if if Team World <laughs> wins. I don't think so. Matthew says he's crushed about Felix. Marcos Giron, yeah, crashing, crashing Adrian Manarino again. 6 1 6 3, was it in uh, Dallas? And now it's a bagel in the opening set in Delray Beach. That's the other ATP tour match going on right now. Of course, we are sort of, um, yeah, wrapping up the day. In Delray, actually, it's still a lot of action left with, uh, what is it, Fritz against uh, Borges, right, after Manarino Giron. But in, in Buenos Aires, we are watching the last match of the day. We'll see how it goes. I mean, it, it, it should be pretty uh, fast-paced, I think. Like, I, I don't think this will be the, the typical golden swing match, you know, the three-hour battle, the back and forth thriller that we often get that you know the likes of Bernabe Zapata Mirales, Roberto Carbaez Baena and all the <laughs> players with two two with the maternal name included. Uh they they are very often likely to serve it to us. I think this one will be a lot more serve based as I said earlier and let's see. Jari with a pretty poor dropper. Vavrinka doesn't fully capitalize but he gets a pretty lucky uh, volley here on the stretch. But yeah, certainly that drop shot from Jari was not the best of ideas. Even if we think about the execution and that it could have been better, yeah, it still wouldn't have worked out probably. But yeah, Vavrinka against Kachin in the opening round, that was a very entertaining match, especially once Stan turned it on in the in sets two and three. I mean, recently, Stan, you're just kind of like watching him and you know that after an hour and a half, he's going to be dead. He's going to be spent and he might keep fighting, might hit some power shots, but it's going to be a rough one for him. But he actually managed his... Uh, 
fatigue, he managed the match very well against Pedro Kachin. And uh, in sets two and three, he kind of out-talented Kachin, if you may. Like, the, the quality gap was just too huge. Which, um, of course, we kind of expect from Vavrinka, but at the age of 38, you never know how much you're going to keep watching it. And also, if uh, if you're interested in sort of Vavrinka's history when it comes to playing in the Golden Swing, because, of course, he's not a regular customer here, he actually played Buenos Aires three times in 2011 to 2013. And he used to play it as this um, Buenos Aires Acapulco double. Yes, Acapulco used to be a clay event. And basically, when it stopped being a clay event, that's when Stan Wawrinka started scheduling himself a little different. Sometimes playing Acapulco, the hardcore event as well. Sometimes playing in Dubai instead and then going to Indian Wells, Miami. Uh, so basically, when it comes to his scheduling, yeah, there was, there was uh, just a three-year stretch when he was playing Buenos Aires Acapulco, a clay double, and eventually uh, Wawrinka uh, stopped playing that once Acapulco became a hardcore event. And in Buenos Aires, he was always going deep. 2011 semifinal, 2012 semifinal, 2013 final. He lost to Ferrer in that last match he ever played in South America before this year. Uh, is it a bit of a farewell tour? I doubt he would care about it. Like, I, I don't think this place this swing this tour holds such a special place in his heart that if he was playing a sort of a farewell tour he would have to come to south america i, I doubt that's the case actually so um so i think this is mostly as he said somewhere i mean he's hoping to make the olympics he wants to get some more clay practice ahead of that as well so i think that's probably more so the um, idea behind this Stan Wawrinka uh, decision to, to even come to Rio. Uh, to Rio, to, to Buenos Aires and Rio, that's what I mean. I was already sort of ahead of myself. Ghosty says he's going to check back when he's home. In the meantime, Jari just claimed his first service game as well with an ace. It was a very tight one, but he made it. And here it seemed like he did everything right until the very last approach shot, which could have been a bit sharper, and Vavrinka passes him cross with the forehand. That backhand angle earlier that Jari produced seemed to be basically point winning, but eventually even he, with the reach that he has, with the <laughs> simply the, the ability to stretch for the ball, he can't touch that Vavrinka pass. And it's an ace from the Swiss as well. Uh, happy for Zachary Sfida. Seems to spend a lot of time not making rounds outside the challengers. Hope you can go one more round this week. I honestly, well, nah, maybe I'm going to keep it to myself. <laughs> kind of think it, it, it would be a bit of a travesty if Sfida went on to, you know, win one more round because, um, some of the, uh, some of the challenger matches that he plays and especially the final recently in, Indian Wells against Blaze Beeknell, he can kind of lose to anyone and, and he's so underpowered. At the same time, you know, I have to um, appreciate the way he can just uh, very often make these, especially these very erratic, powerful hitters. He can just shrink the court for them. He can come up with all this beautiful shot making defensively. Uh, but yeah, I mean, sometimes when I see him trying to generate offense from of his forehand, I just can't, you know, <laughs> it, it's such a flawed shot and, and it kind of leads to, to the, um, let's say to all the dilemmas that Sfida has when it comes to just not being able maybe sometimes to beat players he should be beating, but at the same time going above his head from time to time to just, um, eliminate someone who stylistically is nice for him. But of course, uh, yeah, he's won a few challengers recently, three last year, I believe. And um, yeah, this run can really help him going forwards as well. I think he's just not made to quality, though. Like that That's basically what I was trying to say earlier, that um, I can't really get excited about his run. It's like, you know, Luca Vanash. <laughs> Luca Vanash maybe is more major quality right now than Spida yet. And I'm not, not you know, denying that he can get there in the future, but...
In the meantime, of course, Wawrinka held again. After that brief point early on when Jari was attacking him and approaching to the forehand of Stan, got past and that kind of ended the game. That kind of took all the um, all the wind out of his sails. And I see that Vansh is here. Hello. Hey, what's up? Just saw your text. Um, not, nothing, nothing really. I mean, we just started watching. It was free, easy holds. I do expect it. There will be a lot of that here, right? It, it won't be a typical um, golden swing match, right? It, it won't be a three-hour battle of 20 breaks and some insane uh, sort of back-and-forth momentum swings. It will likely be a very hardcore-ish match, I think. I, I can't believe you just said that because I was just thinking that as I was logging onto the screen. I'm like, this is going to be so atypical of a normal February golden swing match just because we're so used to seeing, you know, your Navon and your Curb Prize Baena and your, you know, yeah, Argentinian and Spaniards who sort of don't. Everyone who uses that paternal and maternal name, you know, when, when they have free names, yeah. you know that they're going to be involved in some absolute thrillers. Yeah. 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 Earlier, earlier, I was also mentioning, I don't know if you know this, but Nicolas Jari is going for his 100th tour level win. I don't know if this is even. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Know, I, I don't pay attention want, to that stuff. But yeah. Yeah. I don't either, but the ATP does. And uh, sometimes I also kind of have to. So, um, yeah, that is, that is a thing. Obviously, Nicolas Jari will not care about that <laughs> because it's. It's pretty ridiculous, <laughs> you know. For if, if a player really thought about this, I mean, yeah, that would be a distraction, really senseless distraction. So for me, it also doesn't matter. But I guess, I guess it is a thing uh, of sorts. Mm -hmm. I think he's ninety nine and ninety in uh, on the main tour. So yeah. And of course, this was uh, last year, the, the part of the season when we got his big breakthrough part two. And uh, uh, basically not Buenos Aires yet because he lost in the qualifying round one, I think. But uh, then Rio and uh, Santiago and breaking the top, one, well, not breaking, but getting back to the top 100. Uh, around this time last year, around Buenos Aires, he was still like 130 something. So. Uh, this is a, a pretty huge, of course, uh, upswing for him if you think about it. And without that, he never would have gotten that 100th win if he gets there. Yeah. <laughs> of course, he'll get there at some point. If not today, then uh, any other point of the year, really. Yeah, he was so good this time last year. I, mean, I remember that match against Alcaraz and Rio, obviously, that is like fresh in my mind still. And then the title in Santiago. Yeah, Santiago a lot more shaky and a lot of emotions at home, but uh, certainly, yeah, the, especially Rio, I think, has to be remembered as one of his peaks when it comes to the level because that was just insane when you know, of the baseline, especially. Obviously, the guy is going to be a great server always, but to yeah. to sort of pull it off in a more controllable, repeatable way of the of the ground on the return as well, that's something that really elevated him. And last year, obviously, this was also the first season when he kind of starts getting any hardcore grass court wins. Mm. That's right. He also made the quarters in Beijing. Uh, that was mm. his, like, is that like the first quarterfinal of his at a hardcore Masters 1000 level? I think so. Well, uh, Beijing is not a Masters 1000, but oh, yeah, Shanghai, yeah, yeah. right? I meant yeah. Shanghai, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think Beijing he lost before the quarters, but uh, but I was thinking maybe you just mean like the first hardcore quarterfinal because it could have been honestly like Los Cabos maybe was his first hardcore yeah. quarterfinal or something like that. And I think he also right. made on grass. But yeah, ATP thousand. I think that was his first probably. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe even his first in general. <laughs> that would be actually kind of surprising, but let's see. <laughs> John, start watching the match and not discuss with us in the chat. I, I he probably doesn't even hear us. He just wants to um, snap at me. 
Yeah, the lounge chairs in, in Delray, Matthew, yes. I, I saw some photos of that. It's definitely a bit of a unique uh, look to Delray. I wonder if that's, you know, how does it work? Like whether there's, there are tickets for that. Maybe Miles can tell us, right? Because he's there. Maybe Miles will be sitting on, on one of the streams. Maybe Miles will be sitting in one of these chairs. Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah, new. I don't the, remember seeing that last year. I mean, they've always had the car on court, uh, but the lounge yeah. chairs is a new addition. Yeah, I, I don't remember seeing it either. I thought maybe it was just, you know, me not paying attention. But but if you're saying that too, then I suppose they weren't there. Free to Vavrinka, John was earlier saying that um, he doesn't believe that it will be a bit, that sort of a surf fest because uh, he didn't think that Stan can keep up with Jari. I think that uh, that's clearly wrong. So, John, start watching and just, uh, you know, learn. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Jari, of course, that was the first uh, quarterfinal at the ATP 1000 level. He, like, barely had any results at the ATP 1000 level. In fact, I think he has, like, half his wins at that level in uh, Shanghai. Hmm. Which is definitely a bit weird. But, uh, well... It's also a matter of sample size. He's only played most of these events like once or twice, really. So it's mm. not like his career, despite being 27, has been very consistent at the top. Obviously, a lot of that coming from that 11-month uh, doping suspension. Yeah. Which, uh, of course, he was like, you know, cleared of any like uh, significant fault. But still, it, it did sidetrack him for sure. Yeah. For Stan, do you think this is a good move to play the golden swing? I think it can be good for him, you know. I don't really know. I think we talked about this on the Ega Carlos show that like I don't really believe in all that um I wanna get more more clay practice for the Olympics thing. Yeah. Like like I don't think it really matters all that much. You're gonna have so many so much time to to play on the clay anyway. And also, you know, between that, you're going to have Indian Wells and Tupa and uh, Miami. However, um, I think in general, playing on clay uh, really helps you, like, build up your endurance resilience. And uh, from that point, maybe, like, that's actually yeah. a thing. And um, points-wise, I don't think it's a big difference. I think if he played the indoor swing in Europe, probably the turnout is, like, more or less the same. May you know, maybe, maybe there can be some variation, but... I think his chances to earn points in the indoor swing in Europe would have been pretty similar. This this field is probably a little weaker, but still mm. it's also clay. You can sort of yeah. That's what get I was thinking also in the build up to like Indian Wells, Miami, slower uh -huh. courts. Maybe this would be where Stan can actually win a couple yeah. more matches than he would otherwise. But yeah. But then you might play like uh, uh, indoor swing. There's also some very um, slow events there. I mean, he's yeah. one Rotterdam. Yeah, Rotterdam is pretty slow, but the field is so good there. That... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, he he wouldn't be winning Rotterdam. Whereas this event, like, he beats Jari and he can make the semis easily. Yeah. Um, I don't know when, but um, if he beats Jari, he can make the semis easily. So I don't know. Um, it, it, it is a choice that I think has to be like just treated you know well, fine it was an option sure especially if it goes well we're gonna be like that's cool i mean and it's and it's super fun to see him in the swing you know ever since i became a tennis fan i guess favrinka was playing the golden swing in 2013 but i wasn't really that aware like yeah. I, you know i wasn't that deep into tennis yet so it's basically my first time watching stan in this part of the world even so um I am I am definitely excited for it. The other players who like kind of showed up for the first time, or at least for me for the first time, so like Chilich, Fields, uh, yeah. yeah, they didn't exactly stay in the tournament for that long. So yeah, how did uh, Chilich look? Did you get a chance to watch him against? I watched Jerry? both matches, Chilich and Fields. Uh, Chilich against Jere was uh, pretty horrific. Like he was yeah. definitely not too fine physically. I uh, I think he had like tampered with his serve a little bit uh, in terms of um, not using that knee that he has injured a lot of uh, like like just too much and the the motion was a little contracted if you may 
And uh, as a whole, like he was just trying to blast the ball. He had zero, I like, zero will to even try to be like sort of you know patient and build up the points in any way. He was just playing serve plus one tennis. He was playing like on a hard court, which sometimes can work. I mean, these two guys will also be playing somewhat hard court ish. And um, yeah, against Jerry in the, I think he had like some break points at the beginning of the second, but after that, it was a really tough watch. Um, his movement, I mean, is is definitely still in shambles. Mm. Yeah, Gene is mentioning that he's withdrawn from Santiago and Rio. So yeah, yeah, yeah. He mm. said he said right after that um, he is like not fully okay with the knee, and um, mm. he might do that. So I it's actually haven't like seen in, that in did, Australia, but... didn't it? I mean, I I thought it was a lot better in Hong Kong, but then in Australia, Hong Kong was amazing. Yeah, we were Hong Kong was amazing. Ocean, we were like, yeah, he's not quite, you know as nearly as explosive as he would need to be. The Chilich withdraw from Rio already? Really? Um, I still haven't seen that, but... To, for me, he's still on the entry list, but maybe he just announced... I don't know. Maybe it's the entry list updates on Twitter. It's... I think that would be... Um, I should have it in my email as well. I don't know. Um, anyway, yeah, he said that he's basically an unsure if he's going to play. Mario posted it. Ah, okay, Mario posted it. And pro then probably Chilic announced it on Instagram or something, and, and he still hasn't uh, actually officially done that, but yeah. Uh, okay, thanks Thanks for the info then. Yeah, yeah, he announced it on like Instagram or something, pr pretty much. Okay. And he says that it was a minor injury sustained in his last match. But yeah, as you said, I mean, Hong Kong was amazing. Uh, he plays like three hours uh, against Struff. Of course, only like a set and a half was from the superb in terms of the quality. But still, I mean, he was actually moving fine there until the, well, maybe al not, not almost until the very end. And yeah, then against Marojan, uh, especially like if I remember correctly to like his backhand corner, he was just not twisting too much and um yeah it, it was an uncomfortable watch for sure he actually still hasn't won a match this year either it was a bit of a funny story with with the jerry match as well right because uh both him and jerry uh, were winless going into that match and also yeah. both wasted match points in their first match of the season both in hong kong oh yeah that's uh, right jerry to to you to um yun shang to yun shang shang right yeah But yeah, Cilic did not really uh, impress us in the Golden Swing. He, for him, it was his first appearance since 2018 when he played Rio and lost to Gael Monfils. Yeah, and um, yeah, Fils also didn't really impress, but I think some of that was just Lajovic being the sort of experienced veteran, the, the cunning player that he is. So I wouldn't be too harsh on it, but of course, it, there's yeah. just one more event coming for him. So... It's not like he has a lot of time to sort of make up for it. It might be a bit of a failed um, decision for... I think even if Vavrinka loses here and loses to in Rio in the first round, it's still already a decent um, like part of the season, a decent, decent swing for him. Whereas Fields is actually in a bit of danger for me because, yeah, obviously he had a couple of semifinals last year in the indoor swing, so... <laughs> If he if he goes to South America instead and goes zero and two, that's we also eventually didn't get Jack Draper, who was initially on some entry lists. And that would have been very fun too, but on the golden swing? Yeah. Oh whoa, okay, that would have been yeah. Interesting. And now we're going to have the first breakpoint of the match for Nicolas Jari, actually, kind of out of nowhere. Vavrinka seemed like the the player who's getting closer yeah. to actually threatening something. He, he missed, like, this volley in the net? Yeah, yeah, there was this volley, and I think the next one was, like, a bit ruined by a net court, and, and now he'll have to be... Yeah, it was a good back uh, cross from Jari. Oh, wait, Let, I think. 
Yeah, I think it's a let on the breakpoint now. So one more chance for Favrinka to get that big serve in. <laughs> Again, I suppose. Yeah, lots of lets. I was recently talking about um, the. Well, actually, I don't think that was a let. I, I don't even know. Um, anyway, they're playing. But yeah, I was recently talking to uh, to, to one of the players at the Koblenz Challenger about the, the lets, and he was of the idea that they should be eliminated right away just to cut down on the speed of the, uh, you know, cut down sort of on the, on the length of the matches. And, and uh, he basically said that when the net is pretty strong, it's impossible to, like, actually get a you know a dead net court of a serve which is is true i mean it would be very rare so mm. anyway uh jari actually breaks here with a bit of a sloppy error so oh, yeah after after a very good start the, the first few games Vavrinka gets broken yeah it was up 30 50 in that game i guess the last point was an unforced error but um hmm. Let's see if he can break back or if Jari just keeps holding. Yeah, he had like some minor chances in the previous one, right? Yeah. See Magnus Norman as well on the screen, who's apparently a friend of John's. <laughs> you weren't here yet, but oh, really? John basically said that he spotted Magnus Norman uh, practicing, you know, at the Favrinka practice. And he decided to email Magnus Norman because apparently for some reason he has Magnus Norman's email and probably there's going to be some interview for, for Talking Tennis this week. So mm. Another friend of the cool. show. Yeah, I mean, um, I also look at Magnus Norman as a bit of a friend of mine because he's the director of that challenger in Dunderit. And it's not like we interacted no. in any way. However, a few times because as the tournament That's director... Right, because he's Swedish. Yeah, and, and as the tournament director, he was actually interviewing a couple of players for like the you know Instagram or whatever. I don't know where they were putting these interviews. So on a couple of occasions, we were sort of um, you know seeing who's going to be faced to a player. <laughs> Basically, I won the race with Cressy and I lost the race with Menchik. So um, Magnus Norman, like you know. <laughs> Are we friends? Are we foes? I, I don't know, but um, I definitely, whenever I see him right now, I'm like, oh, Magnus, <laughs> even though he would have no idea um, who I am. Uh, but when I see him on the screen, just to be just to be uh, clear, you know, when I see him on the screen, I'm like, ah, I know that guy. <laughs> um, and John apparently knows him for some other uh, reason. Vavrinka outfoxing Jari here with that back and slice down the line. I was kind of surprised, but when when I saw Norman in his box in the in South America, they were like, "It's a pretty big trip, you know." Yeah. He kind of still has to think that maybe he can get something out of Stan, I guess, or maybe he's just getting paid very good money. Yeah. Probably both, <laughs> and also they're that you know they're probably good friends by now, so. But um, yeah, it's still a pretty big trip for sure to to make this with sort of a player who's just on the verge of retirement, maybe. That's Hopefully been one he of has the like standing partnerships, right? I mean, they were together from like 2013 to like. Yeah, but it's like on and off, right? They, and then they, they, they broke up and then they got back together again. Yeah. Yeah. It, it wasn't was the full foot, uh, full. There was also that foot surgeries that Stan had. So I guess that's. Man, it fell apart a little bit. Yeah, like, but, but yeah, it's like on and off since 2013. Surgery, right? I feel like he's had more than one surgery. He's had knee. He's definitely and... had two foot surgeries. Yes. Yeah. I read yeah, this yeah, because 2017 was the ago. knee. 2017 was the knee, and then 20, I guess 2021, post 2021 was. Uh, I think he had two mm -hmm. knee surgeries in 2017, and then two foot and surgeries two foot. in 2021. Yeah. I I read this somewhere like two or three days ago. I can't remember where, but. That sounds right. Yeah, it was double knee surgery in 2017. 
and double foot surgery 2021. But anyway, free break wins now. Um, that, that first pass from Wawrinka was pretty cool, but then just Jari missing some plus one shots, essentially. He has a hole that he has to dig himself out of now. First point goes right for him. Yeah. But maybe there's going to be a rally. I mean, there's going maybe there's going to be a point when he doesn't make the first serve or something. Maybe there's going to be another easier error. Oh, whoa, almost lost his balance, but put away that overhead. Next point is pretty fun. I mean, Vavinka is running around like a madman. <laughs> and what a finish as well. I'm not going to spoil it to you, but that was pretty hilarious too. Um, the way the point eventually gets resolved. But yeah, Vavrinka is a bit of a master of the block return, I would say. Mm -hmm. And of course, it gets him into a lot of points. I don't know if on clay it's particularly effective, as it can kind of sit up. I think more so, but maybe. Okay. But maybe he can actually, um, yeah, just get himself into some points. Oh, well, Jari it, can wicked, work. it was a wicked get. Oh, man. Yeah. But Pavrika just barely game. making a forehand squash shot, and Jari is like fairly close to the ball, but uh, he mm -hmm. actually doesn't get there. He doesn't it's like this weird sort of backspin on this. Oh, whoa. Three stats. Yeah. yeah. Some side spin also. That was wicked. He misjudged it completely, but um, yeah, it's, it's not mm -hmm. really his fault, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> it comes as a winner. A <laughs> yeah. It, it's like, I don't know if you watched Sviontek today. <laughs> Oh, but yeah. she she hit like two consecutive fluke return winners. <laughs> uh, that was, I think, the second game of the of the second set. No, sorry, because Alexandra was serving first in the second set. It must have been the first game of the second set, actually. Yeah. And the first one was like um, a bit of a Medvedev Zverev type of thing, whereas oh. the second was just a net court that completely changed the trajectory of the ball. And Alexandrova didn't even flinch to either, uh, which uh, maybe on the second one, uh, I don't know. I mean, she was kind of just very negative in the in the first place, and uh, I was I was amazed that she didn't lose that game. But yeah, sometimes luck can also be involved, and definitely. But but still, I mean, Vavrinka was scrambling around the court pretty great in that in that rally, so uh, he kind of earned it, you know, in a way. Mm -hmm. Especially there was that one inside in from Jari that he like barely tracked and which I think actually was the, the winner from Vavrinka. But but yeah, just the fact that he got to that ball was was pretty impressive. It's uh, we don't really see it from him these days. Or ever really. So mm -hmm. but yeah, five four stand. Pretty easy hold after that. Tomorrow, of course, there's going to be uh, the remaining part of the second round with Carlos Alcaraz, Cameron Nori entering the, the battlefield, if you may. Is it going to be another uh, Carlos Alcaraz, Cameron Nori Golden Swing final this this week? Mm -hmm. Who has the best Maybe. chance to sort of stop them? Maybe. What about uh, Echeverry? He's uh, fair. He could do it. I guess he's one that I have in mind. I mean, he's an Alcaraz's half. But mm, I don't know if I'd pick him to stop it. Lajovic? Lajovic could do it. Lajovic has got... Who is Lajovic? Yeah. Who is Lajovic playing? Um, Diaz Acosta next, I think. And he would have to beat Nori. That's possible. Yeah. yeah. Diaz Acosta can also beat Nori. Of course, he basically beat Nori last year in Buenos Aires. He let 6 4 5 3. Um, Almost, yeah. Darderi, if he has enough left in the tank. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, generally speaking, the the Nori half is is more vulnerable. Let's, I guess, that's yeah. just the conclusion. And it's not really about the quality of the players either. It's just that Nori is more vulnerable. Like Alcaraz, yeah. I could imagine losing to Jerry. 
I think that's possible. Um, Atreveri, uh, uh, maybe Jerry is a little tougher, but um, I think Jerry is maybe the most if he gets through this. Yeah, I just I don't know. I just kind of don't trust him to win the next two matches. You know, both against Stan yeah. and against no, Atreveri. I mean, so I guess, honestly, I guess that's why I'm rating his move. He should be getting to the final with even with this top half. If he's getting to the final, then he should be winning it as well. He right? should, yeah, yeah. He really should. There, there is an argument to be made that his semi-final will be tougher than the final. Yeah. Regardless if it's a very Jari or Vavrinka, really. So hmm. um yeah, still the big favorite. Um Nori is gonna probably have a lot of interesting matches. Like he's probably not gonna have a lot of grind fests and uh, perhaps yeah. he's gonna win all of them because he's Kamnori and he excels in that and he has these huge lungs and yeah. he goes to Wimbledon by bike. He's like Beatrice Haddad Maya on the WTA. Yeah. <laughs> See a lot of parallels between those two. Maybe also just the point in time in which they're uh, the mid twenties and kind of what they base their games and strengths around. Both kind of like on the fringe of the top ten at some point, you know. Did Haddad Maya eventually make it? She did, yeah. She got to 10. They both also reached a semi-final that I don't think many people were predicting of a major. So obviously, there was the 2022 Wimbledon for Cam. And then yeah, I mean, Haddad Maya at least did it on clay, but I guess given, given her um, sort of previous history at the majors, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think doing it. Made... doing it at Wimbledon definitely. Um, up until like two thousand. I think before that run, Haddad Maya had not been past the second round. Yes, yes. So that was definitely a bit of a surprise, especially also the manner in which she did it because she had to save match points against Alexandrova and then. Was... Yeah, but like she didn't actually, you know, have to beat anyone. Let's say well, that that that's a thing on the WTA tour right now. I guess that on clay the competition. Is very lopsided. Like it's also, it maybe also, both, she was helped right. a little bit because like Rybakina withdrew, right? So then... yes, Rybakina withdrew against Soripestormo. So 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 it, it wasn't like a. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's pretty easy to make a French Open semi right now in the WTA tour, because um, yeah, 2022 you had Kazakina also get there. Trevisan yeah. Podoroska. Yeah, there's been a lot of that in recent years, and it's not it's not an accident. Like the the main. Strong players like let's say Rybakina, Sabalenka, well Pegula. I'm going to count her even though she hasn't made a major semi, but like they're all at their weakest on clay. It's not very weak, you know. They're still one of the best, but at their weakest. Of course, uh, I actually don't know if if well maybe Coco will still be at her best on clay, but but recently I've been sort of sort of started thinking that maybe she's not going to be as clay heavy these days as we maybe fought two or three years ago uh but um but yeah, yeah basically the, the competition chances, is more you got, you got rome and you got rg basically yeah uh, and then the rest no no the no slow clay warm-ups yeah so it's basically like shviontek and the rest on clay and mm -hmm. that kind of plays into it no which actually is the same case at wimbledon right with nori <laughs> i mean it was kind of djokovic mm -hmm. and the rest for well, before Alcaraz came along, I suppose. Yeah. Before Alcaraz came along last year, literally, when it comes to his grass sort of pedigree, and probably Sinner will be there um, as a huge threat this year as well. But um, yeah, there was also a, a part of the, so let's say, of the um, 2020s decade, or at least um, the turn of the decades, when it was like Djokovic and no one else on grass, which kind of allows for good um, semi final, quarter final runs. And uh, still, I mean, before 2021 or something like that, no one would have believed that Nori can make a Wimbledon semi. So, sure, mm -hmm. it was still still impressive and still a surprise, yes. Yeah. Vavrinka, for example, has never made a Wimbledon semi. And, never, of course, yeah, that's yeah. the slam that he's never won. And well, at this you, stage... There's two matches that keep him up at night. It's that... Quarterfinal uh -huh. against Gretzky and then probably the ATP finals match against Federer. I think if those were the two, he'd probably won back. I think the Gasquet one is bigger just because it would give him a chance to be in a Wimbledon semi. And I don't yeah. know if he would have done anything. You know, he plays Djokovic and Grass. Have we seen that matchup on Grass even? I don't remember just it off the top of my head. Year, but that's not really 
Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was like post, you know, po post prime, and um, I don't really count it yet, but like in, in mm -hmm. their prime, they never faced at Wimbledon. So I don't know mm -hmm. how it would have gone. Of course, he had a very good record against Djokovic in the, at the majors. Yeah. And um, I guess that's more important. Like the ATP Tour finals, uh, yeah, sure, but is it really something that's going to be like he's going to be lacking in his, um, you know, um, yeah. set of results? I, I don't think so. More so, I, I, I guess I just don't care about the ATP finals. He had, yeah. I, I think yeah, then, he had match um, points, of course. Yeah. Well, and then, of course, we would have actually seen a match at the final because the, you know, for well, many of the last match of the season and then did a walkover. Yeah, so. that was that was very disappointing for sure. And I totally get if someone still like has a bit of a grudge on Federer for that. Because well, ten days later he was playing Davis Cup. Yeah. He wasn't fully fine. But he maybe. wasn't fully fit. Like I remember that match against Monfils and he was yeah. like Yeah. Not really he was just that. blown off the court by Monfils, and, and uh, then, of course, eventually, still ended up giving Switzerland the title. Yeah, but, and then um, also in the doubles, I feel like Stan did most of the heavy lifting in that match, so ended up being a good. Who are they playing? Gasquet yeah. Benetton. Yeah. yeah, And then I kind of knew he wasn't going to lose to Gasquet in the. In the well, game. yeah, I guess Gasquet it was super easy for him. I don't know, but um, certainly they he kind of prioritized Davis Cup over that yeah. final, mm -hmm. which I don't know. I don't really have a problem with that, but um, yeah, just not to get that one last match of the year, that's that's definitely quite disappointing for, well, the fans and especially the fans in the arena. Vavrinka I remember he like, came out and he like showed up in his track pants or whatever and then gave like a little this, a speech or something. Just saying Yeah, he gave a speech and then there was some exhibition with yeah. Mare, I think. Mari, Mari played Joker. But I think that whole ATP finals was just one to forget in general because there just wasn't any good matches. Yeah. Them. Well, the semi was, yeah. was great. But before semi. that, Federer and Djokovic were just crashing everyone. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we might get a tie break in this set. Let's see. <laughs> Nurland, Nurland today was pretty funny on Twitter, for sure. Um, you... Sabanka Rybakina, by the way, is not weak on clay. Come on. I mean, what are the results on slow clay? Rome or yeah. or um well I guess Sabalenka's made semis of Rome and RG. So yeah. and I mean she's her ability is just such that you know she should but get um to, uh, yeah, but, but know, like yeah, they're, they're still know. much weaker down hard courts, you know, is what I'm trying to say. The competition isn't as strong as, as on hard courts. But anyway, um yeah, Nurlan was pretty funny today on Twitter because he told me, well, first of all, that he thanks all you know the God and whoever that I didn't comment on like Świątek improving her serve, which I wouldn't have because, well, it was vulnerable today. And it's, hmm. well, against Azarenka, it's also probably going to be vulnerable. Not yeah. like against um, Ostapenko, but still, Azarenka is one. She won like what, three points on her second serve today, something like that. I mean, who? Iga. Won three points on second serve? Yeah, it was like three of three for uh, if I saw this. Really? I mean, I, I, I thought that Alexandrova missed too many returns for that to be a stat, honestly. But um, what I'm trying to say is also that Nurlan told me to block Eva, that uh, Świątek fan from Poland on Twitter. I don't know if you know her. But, um, oh, yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah, Nurland, Nurland told me to block her oh, because my, she... No, it wasn't 3 for 11. That was... Because she gets on his the second nerves. set. That was just in the second set. My bad. Ah, yeah. Yeah, because th that's impossible because Alexandrova missed yeah. a lot of returns on, like, breakpoints as, as, as well. Uh, yeah. A lot of second serve returns, you know, that she was making routinely. Then yeah. on breakpoints, she would miss. So it was impossible. But, um, yeah, basically, Nurland told me to block her because she gets on his nerves. <laughs> And, uh, oh, well, she doesn't get on my nerves, so I didn't... Yeah, her. I think I've been following her for a while. She's uh, it's the Die Hard Ego fan, that's all. Yeah, she's a Die Hard Ego fan, but she's nice, and um, I yeah. don't have anything against her, really. Um, so my interactions with her have been, have been See, positive, yeah. so... But, uh, yeah, I definitely had a good laugh when uh, Nurlan told me to block her because she gets on his nerves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's definitely a lot of Ego fans on Twitter. I mean, it's it's a really big mm -hmm. fan. It is so huge. It is. It is absolutely massive. And especially if, you know, probably even, even more so you see it if you're Polish. Yeah. 
this is one video that still makes me laugh. And it's from an ego fan, actually. There's this uh, account, Sarah, I think, is her mm-hmm. name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like when Djokovic did that challenge thing that he was doing, like with the flexibility. Uh, like he, Djokovic had this like flexibility challenge post that he did. I want to say like pre ATP finals at some point. Mm-hmm. And then you know, know, the fans were trying to do it as well. And then tagging Novak in it. And so she just does this one uh, impression of Djokovic's post. And <laughs> it's like, it like really blew up and it was so funny. Mm-hmm. And she just like, she was like, what's the big deal? I can do this in my sleep. And then she just took a video and then like, Basically, just <laughs> semi mock Djokovic in it. It was pretty funny. And did she really do it? Like, was yeah, it- yeah, yeah. She did it. Okay. Did it really well, actually. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then she was like really wanting to get Djokovic to see it. And then actually, Djokovic, I think, saw it and liked the post or something. So, yeah. And <laughs> Jean talking mm-hmm. about the Azarenka and Penko handshake. Was she like sick or something? Do we know by now? Oh no! Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The handshake, yeah, because she just extended out her racket. And... Yeah, I, th- I mean, usually you do that when you're sick, right? Like Kazo yeah. didn't shake Hurkap's hand, That's for like example. At the handshake. Time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you usually do that when you're sick, for sure. So um, I would. That's my assumption, but at the same time, it's also painful. So. <laughs> It could have been everything, you know. Yeah. It could be yeah. everything, and especially given she's zero and five in the matchup, and yeah. there's only one two sets. Um, I think Azarenka also didn't like the medical timeout that Penko took. Um, yeah, to freeze down in the second. Well, if she was sick, then it would make sense that the medical timeout kind of seemed like nothing, right? Because you don't mm-hmm. really have any apparent. Well, at least most of the time, you're not gonna be sick in a visible manner um yeah. unless you're like maybe blowing your nose or i can't something. say for sure but that definitely seemed like one of those iffy timeouts where like she was just sort of trying to do everything possible to you know maybe get break the momentum a little bit but it's hard to tell yeah we like, have to something with the right upper leg or anything but we didn't see any sign of it in the match itself so i'm not sure we have to give the benefit of the doubt because well yeah. we were in there we're not doctors but um you don't know yeah so it's so Azarenka, it, it's something that Azarenka could actually have wouldn't be that offense. surprising if she was feeling it because she has played a lot of tennis right i mean she did play but then yeah. she didn't play last week either she didn't so then... play last week though so yeah, I, I i think it's fine yeah she's played 17 matches and also in doubles she's played like 10 or something but yeah. but yeah it's a lot of tennis but she didn't play last week so i don't yeah. think it's a big deal now it's not Karina Pliskova. <laughs> no, that's absurd, by the way. What is going on there? Yeah. Someone just asked me on, on, on Twitter, and I, I, will, I will reply after the match, I guess, uh, what do I think about her chances tomorrow? <laughs> and honestly, I mean, it, it's like one of these runs where everyone should be probably stopping her by now. Yeah. But at the same time, she's just unsinkable, and I just don't know how long to continue. You know what would be we're funny? We're going to get that high-quality match that we saw in Brisbane. Between those yeah. Two. But that's reasonable to expect, even yeah. You know what would be funny if um, Pliskova again gets to Świątek and withdraws, and it's actually very oh. possible by now because again, she did it in Doha last happen? year, right? Oh, did she withdraw against Iga? Okay, yeah. That she literally good. did it in Doha last year because it was um, it was just three matches for Iga, and she lost mm-hmm. five games, right? And and yeah. it was Pliskova who withdrew. So um, okay, yeah, this is be- very possible this year as well that she plays one more match, but then she's just unable to continue for the semis. <laughs> yeah, I do think these February tournaments are a bit brutal for the WTA. Like it's such quick turnarounds and these one week, and like they finish the tournament on Saturday, I think, and then Sunday is because the weekend yeah. over there is Friday and Saturday, as opposed to Saturday Sunday. Yeah, I mean, with, with finishing the tournament on Saturday, um, it kind of doesn't work. Like, there really should yeah. be some sort of a performance by. There should. The it would make a lot of sense for this. For the players who were in the final, simply in Abu Dhabi and Cruz. And, uh, because I found it absurd that Pushko was playing the next day and Kazakina was playing the next day. Yes. 
I, I don't think that's right. I mean, th there was no other way to, to, to sort of work your way, work their way around it because the yeah. first round had to be completed on Monday uh, with the Saturday finish. So it's not like we could have done anything to avoid it this year. But for next year, if we can yeah. introduce performance buys, obviously it's not a big deal if the players are seated uh, or let, I say if they're seated in whatever the whatever yeah. is the group of seats that uh, doesn't play the so the first round, but it is a big deal for Kasatkina, for Pliskova, and would have been for Ada Bogdan, I guess, as well, if she played the event. I actually don't know if Ana Bogdan played the event, honestly, but I don't think she did, right? No. I think it was just Pliskova. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't um, think she went high enough to even be on the. Oh, that was Dubai, you say? Uh, against Iga. So who withdrew against Iga in Doha last year? I think it was, no, I think it was Doha. Oh, Bencic, with, Bencic withdrew against Doha. Ah, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Okay. So so she got two withdrawals in Doha and Dubai? Uh, because I knew that there was a withdrawal in Doha. I just assumed it was Pliskova, but, but yeah, you're right. She did withdraw in Dubai. Uh, so yeah, that, that story is a little weaker now. Hmm. Yeah. Of course, Do you we think Slam could win, win another yeah. ATP title. What about Osaka winning a Slam? Osaka uh, winning a Slam was actually more likely, right? More, more likely than Stan winning an ATP yeah, title, yeah. for sure. Yeah, Stan. I mean, since Antwerp has he been close? Umag, I guess. Hmm. Last year, yeah, he was hmm. quite close against Popper and had some chance. Hmm. A clay to fifty somewhere. It's possible, Perhaps yeah. not a clay to fifty with Carlos Alcaraz involved, but mm -hmm. clay to fifty somewhere. I don't know. I mean, now that I think of it, but but yeah, Osaka is actually sort of making me pretty confident that you know, and and at least on hard courts, she will be back in the mix. Yeah. Uh, well, she kind of already is. I mean, we'll see what happens this week, but yeah, I don't, I don't really think she's gonna be a threat to win the title, but but um, yeah, by the U.S. Open, for example, why not? Yeah. So yeah, Osaka, I would say, has a better chance of winning a major than Stan the title, but still, Stan came very close in Umag. Yeah, I and, uh, comparing uh, Murray and Stan, you know, in their comebacks, and just maybe just by virtue of their 2017 Roland Garros semi, or their 2019 Antwerp final, which is yeah, also... yeah, yeah, which also it really seemed at the time that Stan was going to win that final, didn't it? And <laughs> kind of was. It was a big story that uh, Murray ended up doing it the same year that he basically retired. And then, yeah, since then, uh, they both have come pretty close. Actually, Murray was also a set away, wasn't he, in 2022 in Stuttgart against Perry? Yeah. He was a set away. So, well, I guess Doha was pretty good as well. Like, he didn't come super close, but it was a competitive yeah, final. Was... Stan kind of feels to me like he's been better in like the big matches against the, you know, bigger names. But um, of course, Murray has had a lot of challenger success and a lot they of. They haven't been past round three of a slam. Yeah, at the slams they haven't they haven't performed. No. Well, no, no. I mean, for Stan, you still have that excellent twenty nineteen season, so you can't really. Well, after two thousand. Yeah, after you know, after after, 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 Antwerp, after the Antwerp, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, after Antwerp, let's, let's, yeah. let's go after Antwerp. I guess 2020 Roland Garros would have been a good chance for him. Was that the first yeah. round that they played as well? Yeah, they played in the first round and Murray, uh, Povrinka thrashed Murray, but then he lost yeah. to Gaston 6 in the Gaston, third. Yeah. Or in the fifth, I mean. In the fifth, yeah. Is that a double fault from Nicolas Jari? I think so, and it might actually mm -hmm. be very meaningful right now. Yeah. Given that uh, this is a mini break and Favrinka will get yeah. a couple of serves. There's like this long pause between the first and second serve because the umpire came down to check them out. Yeah. I'm guessing now this yeah, is. Yeah, that, that, that never helps for sure. Mm. I feel like a lot of the time, if I was playing like you know a match with umpires, I would be like, no, no, just stay there. I want to serve again. I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the long pause is always. A bit tense. I hate it when the when the ball like you know bounces off the net, but it comes back 
not sort of you know to decide yeah then you have to go you and, and you have to you have to pick it up and yeah, yeah. Then you start again basically yeah because we don't have ball boys unfortunately picking up the balls for us <laughs> yeah i mean even even on the itf tour you're not gonna get ball boys so yeah. it's um it's not like you know even in pro tennis it's it's not a thing mm. It's a funny return from Jari as he sort of just gets a huge body serve from Vavrinka at him. And he actually makes it back in play. It's sort of like the fluke of Vavrinka, you know, a few games ago. But um, no, it's, it's not as effective. It's, <laughs> and um, Vavrinka gets free set points. Vavrinka is one of those players that's absolutely jacked in the upper body. I mean, it already looks like it on TV, but when you see him in person, oh, I mean, he has... You can really see why he gets that power on the serve. Yeah, and that power on everything. And Jari is not even going to force him to like serve it out. He commits a pretty horrific uh, vo volley error trying to serve and volley at 3-6. So first set goes to Stan Pavrinka. Um Honestly, you know, a serving contest as we expected. And that, that one break that Vavrinka was able to aim back was definitely quite crucial. He did it in a funny way. Of course, he was still 15-40, uh, like 40-15 up. So it's possible that without this, he still breaks. And he did ha have some like really good, you know, movement around the court there defensively. But mm -hmm. as a whole, I mean, it's been very tight for sure. Uh, Vavrinka definitely keeping up in terms of the serving game. Yeah, he was also quite sharp, I guess. You know, they won the won that first point of the eighth game when Jari tried to go for the drop shot, but it wasn't quite good enough. And Stan like was able to squeeze it past him down the line, and then that's the game that he broke, right? Oops. Mm -hmm. I don't. No. Oh, I guess I don't think you can hear me. Oh, now you can. No, no, I can hear you. I can hear you. I, 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 I could hear you all the time. Could uh, so I guess you were replying to that earlier, right? When Sean said could stand trim down a bit. Yeah. yeah. When when you were talking about his like physical build. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like de definitely there are a few players like this who don't really look like athletes, maybe. <laughs> I mean, like Nicholas Armagro was another one who was okay. You know, yeah. Quite, uh, that's he fair. He could really hit the ball hard and had the similar type of power, like deep behind the baseline and just like producing these winners and on the yeah. backhand. It's not like Streaker, I guess, when he's sort of producing this mm. despite his build. Oh, Majerovic yeah. is a great example. Um, yeah, he has similar build for sure. Yeah, By the way, what's up with Majerovic? I'm sort of not following him. He's been right. sick. I don't know what exactly is the case, but he was offered a Rotterdam wildcard and he pulled out of it like three, three weeks in advance with an illness, which is a bit weird mm -hmm. because usually that's not how it works, right? So I don't know what the illness is. As mm -hmm. you know, right now he was supposed to be back in Doha qualies and he's also withdrawn from that. So uh, basically, right now he he's next signed up for a challenger in Lille, and then qualifying for Indian Wells, which is also a pretty tough schedule, <laughs> generally because if he wins Lille, let's say, or makes the final, then Indian Wells starts almost right away. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, hopefully he's going to be back soon. Um, basically, he has kind of wasted the two months when he had little to defend. Mm -hmm. Then again, I feel like if Hamad just gets back on the tour relatively healthy then we don't really have to look at the point situation with him like he should just be able to get big enough results to, to still break the top 100 this year but but um yeah he should definitely be top 100 if he's healthy yeah but let's see i mean when he's back because basically he's been like delaying the return mm -hmm. for the past couple of weeks and yeah he was supposed to get a rotterdam wildcard but eventually it went to jesper de jong yeah Yeah, that's clearly a double bounce. Any bold predictions for Rotterdam, or you think, uh, you know, it's pretty much Sinner's title to lose? It's tough to beat Sinner. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I kind of struggle to see who can do it, you know? I guess Hurkacz um, would be the potential semifinal opponent. Yeah, I mean, Hurkacz can beat um, anyone, really, in a serving mm -hmm. contest. Raonic quarters, if he holds up physically somehow, 
I don't think Monfils is going to do it. I think it's going to be a bit of a brutal match for Gael, for sure. So I guess Hurkacz, yeah, just because of a lottery factor you can get is maybe a, the biggest mm-hmm. threat on the way to the final. I think and even then, if, if, if Rublev gets to the final, I think Hurkacz is probably the bigger threat. Yeah, I mean, if anyone from the bottom half, really. Like, if you got a full, um, let's say, full danger runner. I don't know who the other seed is. Oh, Runa. Yeah, yeah, but Runa right now is... Uh... Yeah, like, it, it potentially, if you got a 100%, you know, sort of Runa from the early um, early days of the 2023 season, then maybe him. Then but time. anyone else in the draw, to me, is, is not really a threat to Sinner, you know? The no. Minor, Rublev, Dimitrov... Eh, I don't really buy it. Not really, no. So um yeah, it's it's gonna be tough to stop Sinner, and especially after the performance today where you kind of see that well, he doesn't have a, any, you know, lull after getting a slam, which I don't think was going to be the case. And maybe we also haven't seen yet that it's not going to be the case. Like there is an argument to be made that he might sort of falter when there's pressure, but like today he was absolutely flawless and just hitting in a way that didn't allow Van der Zanskop to do anything. Yeah. The decent defensive points from Vavrinka keep coming, actually, with this pass. Yeah. As he's already threatening the Jari serve at least a little bit at the beginning of the second. Let's see what's going on with Giron. I saw he was... Uh... Yeah, on the first to have bagel, but, but then I think it, it got a lot more complicated. Oh, he lost the second set. Exactly. Uh, I, I saw earlier that Spanarino was 5-4 up. Didn't see the end of the, the set. Yeah, it was deuce, so he was two points away. And then, I guess two points away in the tiebreak as well. Oh, he was yeah, up 4-2 in long. the tiebreak. So, Spanarino fought back, I guess. It would be a better win in Delray than it was in Dallas, I think, so... Let's see if he can pull it off. Someone who's been kind of struggling at the net. And part of that is, of course, that back in slice from Wawrinka here, which was dipping really low. But that's another volley miss from Nicolas Jari to give Wawrinka the break point. Yeah, I mean, Wawrinka can beat both these players. And, you know, I mean, he beat Echeverry twice last year. In the majors, yeah, remember and you know. it, it might be a decent matchup, you know, like he gets a lot of time there, right? Like, yeah, yeah, and also there's not really a ton of baseline variety that Echeverry brings. No, 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 he yeah. just he just gets what he wants, like he really yeah. gets so much time to tune in the ground strokes. Yeah. So, I guess he has the forehand drop shot, but that's not quite you know, you still need. Well, it's not going to be a thing mm. if he's not on the front foot, if he's not, you right. know, ahead. Mm. No. Oh. <laughs> well, this next one, I mean, is, is kind of comical. Favrinka sets himself up to take this. Like, he's really in a great position to do it. And, yeah, the choice here to go for that back and drive volley... I'm not a fan. I'm not, I'm not a fan. I mean, it's just such a risky shot. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. Oh, okay. Hmm. Decided to take that in the air from no man's land. Yeah. Huh? It's such yeah, a low margin shot. Really the definition of no man's land right there. I mean, I guess, I guess what the, you know, we sort of have to think about like what the other option was and I guess neither option was great in that position. Right. But yeah, but, but still that was a very, very tough shot to pull off. Yeah. And especially on a break on a break point up. Cool. We'll see if it ends up hurting him. Well, it already has ended, you know, has hurt him, but let's see if if it becomes crucial. These low dipping slice back and slice passes have been pretty great from Vavrinka, though. Every single time he lands it in a very similar spot, similar uh, trajectory as well. 
and yeah, I mean, what Sean you said earlier about the stamina uh, definitely has been an issue with with Avrinka. But um, against Kachin, he played, um, you know, three sets and stayed fine. So, but yeah, in in best of five, he's definitely struggled with that recently. Even though you get the day off, he keeps drawing lefties in the first round of majors. Um, was there like a Ramos Villas match? Or? Uh, Ramos Villas, Villas, uh, Hugo Gaston, and like, no, who else? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> he keeps he drawing was, it was you who said he keeps drawing lefties. Ramos Villas, I think, is oh Molchan. Molchan is the other one. Oh Molchan, okay, yeah. yeah. There was a there was a drag with Molchan at the Australian Open. The Ramos, I think, was yeah. with the French, right? Yeah. Um. Oh, Yoko also, yeah, so there's been quite a few. Okay. He definitely played Echeverry twice, as we said earlier, but I don't yeah. remember who he played in the first rounds there. But... <laughs> and Ishioka, as you said, and Wimbledon was... Yeah, no, no lefties at Wimbledon. But yeah, Ramos Vignola as the, the five-setter at, at the French and Molchan, of course, yeah. Both matches unnecessarily long. One of them he lost, one of them he actually won but it kind of ruined his chances in the second round so mm. basically has to be very efficient in the first rounds and he hasn't been actually the he almost lost in the first round in 2017 as well he almost lost to Kui Jean. yeah but there is a vintage back and yeah. cross and it all starts with that block return again the backhand that makes you gasp is the crowd applause? The backhand that makes people go crazy and say that the backhand is Vavrinka's best shot. Yeah. <laughs> oh, his best shot? Yeah. Uh... No, it's 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 like the Djokovic save thing, you know, where um, for many years everyone says that we're not talking about Djokovic serve, we're underrating Djokovic serve to the point where it's actually not underrated at all. Or like and the doubt voice. Or like Nadal's volleys, or like the fact that with Vavrinka, you know he's really everyone really was saying for years that, um, well, the backhand is the flashy shot, but it's not actually the, you know, the bread and butter shot. Yeah. And uh, actually by now everyone knows it. And it's like not really, you know, no. a, a, a topic that surprises anyone anymore. Yeah. But, but he uh, did really I, improve his forehand, like 2013, 2014. Yeah. I feel like the forehand and the mental toughness and maybe, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and for a while, the, the forehand and the serve, um, they were really just not talked about enough because everyone was just like, oh, did you see that one hand there? Yeah. But, um, you know, it's it's the flashier shot, but it's still not. I think that's what, what you're really bothered somebody like, like Owen, right? Because he, he always points that out. That <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Owen mm. has a campaign against one handers. Yeah, it's not that he doesn't like them. He just thinks that it's it's overdone to well, the point where everything on social media just makes you think that like, like you'll see Sitsipas hit a backhand, like ordinary backhand shot or pass. Yeah, I, I, I know, I know. You think yeah. he would think that casual fans would think that you know, the backhand is his best, but yeah, I mean, kind of he will post like a you know beautiful. Uh, or whatever the caption will be, right? And and it's just a regular pass. Yeah. I forgot what the caption was, but like, yeah, it's like. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember. It either, but I, I know even the shot that you're referring to. I think, but but yeah, it's it's definitely happened a lot of times. But but he he does kind of dislike. Like he maybe he doesn't dislike one handers, but he definitely thinks that they are sort of useless. <laughs> 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 no. They are not as effective. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. they are they, they, they have the artistic argument. value but they don't have the value in terms of efficiency which is kind of true yeah no no one teaches I guess the main advantage would just be like right now. the main advantage would be like what power i mean you can hit like 80 85 reach in a way as well yeah. um maybe perhaps the, the, the slice the, the volleys, volleys and yeah finesse, exactly. like those kind of other parts yeah yeah. Maybe the backhand volley is easier if you have a good Yeah. You know, backhand slice with a but um but then course, on the return yeah. there's definitely a lot of drawbacks, you know, controlling the pace, uh, the first serve return, especially going down the line, uh mm -hmm. hitting of shoulder height balls. There's that's a huge problem. 
Mm. You know, yeah, I could I could go on <laughs> having yeah. one enter myself, I could go on. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of disadvantages. <laughs> but um yeah, of course, um no one really to teaches their kids one handers anymore if they're like thinking of a serious tennis career you're you it, it's really hard to find a youngster like a few years ago we used to have so many of them like Tsitsipas team Shapovalov all of their actually all that brings us to the next there. thing which is that uh you know if Tsitsipas doesn't manage to hang on to the number 10 spot this week we'll have the first time ever yeah. in ATP history there won't be a single one-hander in the rankings and it's a it's a sign of the times like we should get used to this I was uh, just yeah, recently yes, checking. We were talking about Owen and the one-handed backhand. Yeah. Period. Yeah, and then also hitting an open stance is a lot harder with a one-hander. I mean, it's just basically no one. The only one who I've seen actually do it is team. Team, you know? yeah. It, it kind of says something that you say um, open stance, one-handed backhand, and we both instantly think of team. Because yeah, yeah it's, it's it's just not too well. I don't even want to say popular. I mean, if they if the players were were able to pull it off, they would maybe be hitting it more. But... Can. I, maybe yeah. Dimitrov at like some point, but like it's not. You know, mm. even for him, it's not very common. So. Yeah, it's, it's different. It's like more technical, not yeah. not as powerful, I guess. Like his wrist but, yeah. is really strong. For team, it's like yeah, he actually like does mm -hmm. the open stance. Yeah, yeah. For 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 Dimitrov, it's a, it's a different, I guess. Um, way of hitting it, but um, it's a break point for Jari now. So that um, drive volley that Vavrinka hit on the, on the break point in the previous game it might really come back to bite him. And um, just just sort of on a relate on a related note, I was recently because of that uh, challenger final that we had be between two one handers, so Martino and Pechi Pericard. I was just looking at the previous um, ATP, uh, sort of previous challenger finals with one-handers, and I was surprised that it's already over two years. And then I started thinking about the ATP tour, and it's even longer there. So, um, like yeah, a final just, with two one-handers? Yeah, again? a final with two one-handers. Yeah. Like in any ATP tournament? Yeah. Uh, when was the last time? You said over two years ago? That was challengers uh, over two years ago oh, with 200 wow. events last year, right? Wow. Well, 196, but still, with I mean, even with the 196 event last year, it was still since Nox. I mean, team and Sitsipas 2019. Yeah. That the finals. That's the one. Is that the one? And there were actually four or five that year, uh, but after that, none. And yeah, that's that's also just something. Yeah, after team declined. You kind of have, and Shapovalov also went away, and he's never really been re reaching that many finals in the first place. You mm -hmm. kind of just have Tsitsipas there, and and that's really it. I mean, Chikinato is not around really yeah, anymore. Really... Uh, Altmaier doesn't reach finals yet. Dimitrov, of course, for years was not reaching finals. Right now, yeah. he's back in the mix. So maybe we will actually get, let's say, a Dimitrov Tsitsipas final somewhere, Dimitrov Shapovalov, Tsitsipas Shapovalov, any combination like that. But uh, yeah, especially in like the generation 0, 2, 0, 3 and below, it's very rare to encounter one hander. You see Giovanni Peci Pericard being the, the main exception to the rule, but most of the others don't really even like, get far enough for us to notice them. I, I guess Privara is the other example, but so far he's struggling on the ITF to ITF to really. Yeah, Jari completely shifting the, the momentum of that second center round after Vavrinka missed the back and drive and, mm. and now that, he could be in control. That seemed like a very basically. crucial point now. So. Yeah. I suppose he was just feeling so good that he could, you know, pull off that shot. But yeah, 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 it was definitely some one that you know you would feel very good about yourself after hitting. Of course. And there would be like, a, I you know, yeah, it would come like, on, guys, give me a reaction. Yeah. Kind of like the point in that game that he did at Deuce when he hit that cross court winner, and then we were all just like, "That's the one that makes you grasp." 
gasp, you know? Yeah. So maybe that could have been the one instead, and then he would actually be <laughs> ahead in this match. But Vansh, are you worried about John's blood pressure? No, I'm more <laughs> worried that you might just say something and then after that be like, hey, I'm drinking, you know? <laughs> like he did that one time. Okay. Well, there was that one time where he was trying to guess my age, right? And then he was like, oh, you know, he's, I think I wouldn't have guessed that you're only 23. And then and then later he's like, I'm drinking a beer. So, and so I don't actually. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So like, well, maybe it's the beer talking or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, there was something like that. No, but... Isn't he? Uh, is he really drinking a beer at the Buenos Aires event? Well, maybe it's very casual. I guess it's also like somewhat warm there. Last year, definitely, there were a couple of challengers in the summer when I was like, oh, I, I drink a beer right now, but you know, I'm too professional for that. <laughs> I do it when I get back <laughs> home. <laughs> sometimes at events especially in the summer of course there is that um for some reason there is that extra a bit of motivation <laughs> yeah the us open you can get the honey juices but i haven't actually for, tried for yeah. such a ridiculous price i don't think i would ever get them bucks <laughs> per honey juice Ghosty says that the, the jabs we got may make it possible to hit a free-handed forehand. Maybe what um, Teodor Davidov is doing will become the norm, you know? Just not yeah. hitting a backhand at all. I doubt that's going to actually work. The pro uh, apparently, there was a top 100 player on the WTA side that used to do it in like the early 2000s. Hmm. I didn't know that, and I have never heard of her. Had never heard of her, rather because by now I've heard of her. However, um, yeah. Did Fran so Jones get to the top 100? This is random, but... Who? I feel like she was very close. Fran Jones? Uh, I don't think and Of so. course, she plays with, like, what, three toes and... Yeah, yeah, I, I know who you mean, the, the, the Brit, but I don't think she was that No, close. she didn't get that high. Yeah, like 140, 50. 149, from... okay, so still pretty... That's still pretty yeah. good, She guess. qualified for a slam, didn't she? She did, yeah. Mm, Australia, maybe, but that's a guess. I think it was Wimbledon 2021. Let me check. I think Wimbledon 2021. Maybe she qualified for both. Oh, Wimbledon and Australian Open. So oh, both. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But was, uh, was Wimbledon qualifying or did she just get a wild card, though? Oh. Actually, she probably, got, she probably got a wild card, right? Yeah, she probably got a wild card in Wimbledon. So Australia was probably the one where she actually qualified. Yeah, I remember that one actually now. Yeah, she got a wild card in Wimbledon. Yeah. yeah, I was just remembering the the color of the courts at the Australian Open, you know, with some with some um, yeah, just, just flashes of of some of her matches and and the blue color. But yeah, at Wimbledon she got a wild card. So, um, but yeah, she didn't get that close. If anyone that doesn't know what the hell we're talking about, Teodor Davidov is this junior who's like, what, 13 right now? And yeah. he basically doesn't hit backhands. Whatever the side of the you know court he gets the ball to, he just hits forehand regardless if it's a right hand or left hand. Which, um, yeah, apparently there was a WT8 of 100 player who did that um, a few, well, let's say 20 years ago. Weird, but maybe it can work. Um, recently, there was also that Korean player, Kim, um, I can't remember the, the first name, but uh, he was like 500, 400 maybe. So, you know, it's, it's somewhat possible. We'll see how far Davidov goes. Uh, some players, of course, have been doing that, uh, let's say, you know, in, in situ on situational balls. Maria Sharapova kind of being famous for it, but probably uh, not using it as much as like, I don't know, Yaroslav Pospishin, who almost got into the top 100. And like, anytime he's stretched to the backhand, he goes for a left handed shot. So, JJ Wolf hit a famous left handed pass. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, it's yeah, one shot. It's one pass. shot, but I mean, you know, it's it kind of shows the year? It's 2022. Yeah, I think in fact, in like a compilation or whatever it was by the ATP, it was like top three. Uh, I can't remember, you know, which spot. But yeah. 
but it was definitely super high. And now Wawrinka has to save more breakpoints. He does save one, but you know, at this stage, if he loses the second break, it's kind of going to be like a well, the set is gone. Is that Sabatini? No, that is Sabatini. They just showed in the crowd, Gabriella. Yeah, I don't really know any other Sabatinis. <laughs> it does not look like she's 50. I'll tell you that. Is that a bit of a, yeah, a, bit of a last full comment from, from Vansh? <laughs> <laughs> she, looks, she looks a lot younger. I'll just... Maybe it's... You guys can you guys can think for yourself, um, you know, what the answer is. But... <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, two breakpoints have been saved, and I think now Favrinka fights a serve out, uh, fights an ace out wide as well. So keep, keeping himself in it didn't, um, you know, give it away. As I think at, at like four love, he kind of probably would have half tanked the rest of the set against Jari. Although, well, especially at his age and yeah, that would make where sense. Where he is with his career. If he gets broken here, know. just let the set go. Because then, if you're like, yeah, if you just come back but then don't win, you're likely done anyway. Yeah. Unless you know you get to like love 30 and then you feel like, okay, maybe there's a chance. Yeah, but he's still not out of the woods in this game. In fact, he's just lost like a cut and mouse point. Had a bit of an open, uh, let's say, half of the court on the last shot and misses that slice. Yeah, I mean, on the replay, it's very hard to tell if he even missed it. But, well, of course, it's clay. He got the mark. Well, we said earlier that it's probably not going to be a typical clay court match. And it's not maybe in terms of, you know, how the rallies are going. But can it be a three-hour match? Uh, well, yeah. it is, mm -hmm. it's is—it's not impossible. In the meantime, of course, Marcos Giron still battling Adrian Manarino in the Ray Beach. Currently, a break point for Marcos Giron in the fourth game of the third set. That would be quite a couple of weeks for Giron if he was able to make the quarters here as well. Quarters, probably semi. Big beats Kipson. Uh, uh, Kipson is awaiting. Uh, I don't know. Maybe at some point the fatigue gets to Giron as well. Uh, but eventually Vavrinka holds after of course, this. Gibson taking out Kachmanovic. Yeah. First round. Was, uh, definitely a bit of a surprise. Yeah, I didn't watch it. That last match in Delray is usually a bit out of my range. Especially yeah. as this week, again, all the challengers are like early in the day for me. Um, of course, you've got India, you've got um, Bahrain, so basically that's why. So last match in Delray is usually not something that I watch. In fact, sometimes even the last match in Buenos Aires is not something I watch. Today being the exception since uh, Jari Vavrinka is definitely a compelling match. And also John Silk asked me if I can do it, and I wanted to watch it anyway, so why not? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Favrinka saved himself, and the set uh, doesn't have to like he hasn't ha he doesn't have to give up on the set yet. Let's say that. Especially as now he goes fair deal of up on the Jari serve. Again, that block return just getting him into a lot of, well, so actually not that sort of disadvantageous positions. Like he's actually not usually 
you know, straight up on the defense after that. Yeah, I mean, unless you're going to, like, I don't know, seven volley off of it, which I guess you could do on a fast record. Yeah, I mean, sometimes that suits Vavrinka even because the ball is going to be so low. And... Yeah, he's going to be able to play. He hits that forehand block return really nicely also, and he's able to yeah. get it right at your feet. I remember years ago, I don't remember which US Open it was, but I wrote a whole article on uh, Vavrinka's forehand block return. <laughs> Maybe it was kind of excessive, but um, <laughs> well, I, I do remember that yeah. one US Open. I can't remember which one. Yep, love 30, and then now he goes way back on the second serve return. I guess you're like a full point ahead of me this whole time. Anyway. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Didn't quite give himself. That was maybe a half chance right there at love 30, you know, to get into the point, but not to be. Yeah, second serve, definitely just standing so far back to give himself as much time as possible. Yeah. But it also kind of doesn't work in his favor on the next point. Like, from start to finish, he's really... I mean, he, if he, he never uh, gets out of that position. Yeah, you know? yeah. let's see if he, he's able to, like, get back up on the baseline because that's what cost him that last not point. In the, not in the next point, yeah. And that, that's what cost him the, the rally because... Um, yeah, yeah so they're all, he, he's, heavy there. he's gotta be coming forward and you know okay anyway and it would help if that heavy return is like actually heavy as well like it was just kind yeah, of it was you know. sitting up a little bit too much yeah sitting that's up hard, that's obviously the the court. so far back and even if the guy is not going to serve in volley because he's still going to have an easier plus one with all the space to work with you know so yeah yeah, he, ne he never got back from so that capable position. and so powerful that he can hit that ball deep. And he should oh, be yeah. able to, you know, sometimes even find the righty backhand. Or, I mean, why am I saying righty? Just backhand in general, you know. Just after that. Turn. You were you, you got you got too much into Teodor Davidov, you know. And, uh, yeah. you, you were <laughs> like, what if a player would be hitting righty backhand and lefty backhand? <laughs> But um, yeah, I mean, the last couple of rallies, he just starts the point there and he ends the point there. And that's not yeah. ideal. Yeah, again, too far back. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's a really horrible game, honestly, from Vavrinka. Like, I know he was low yeah, 30. Is... I, know, I know he is 30 of up, but he, like, absolutely uh, wasted. It doesn't make game. sense to me tactically right now because, like, he should be at break point. But he's like, no, he's at. <laughs> yeah. Just sort of, I guess, played on the played played around with the idea that Jari might miss a shot or two, but he actually didn't. We could just criticize being a three-time Grand Slam champion. <laughs> yeah, we we'll make the sports keto page tomorrow. Patrick Kipson, uh, Genus is asking about him. I mean, I don't know if there's that much to talk about, honestly, but he was a, actually a pretty solid junior, of course, then um, had a venture to college as well. I think Texas A&M. And then a couple of years ago, he, uh, well, a couple of years ago, like two years ago, he comes back. He d actually turns out to be like a, total um, goat of the wildcard challenges for the um, USTA, you know, the American wildcards. He picks them up for both the French and the Australian Open. And in the meantime, he actually makes serious progress. Like the, the guy from being the worst player in the round, Garros Draw, because he won that wildcard on green clay. Well, on, on, actually on red clay as well in San Luis Potosi, but that was altitude. 
and he wins that wildcard. He's the worst player in the draw by far. He actually draws Radu Albot as well, so they're probably t- the two worst players in the draw. <laughs> but there, were also, there was also Vavasori and Pechi Peri card or something like that. No, Vavasori, no, Olivieri and Pechi Peri card in the first round or something like that. But anyway, they are probably one of the worst players in the draw. And uh, by the Australian Open, he wins another wildcard. He's actually a threat already. Like, he pushes Rusovori. He's serving, like, a madman right now. He's just... Yeah, it's a lot. It's really a parent is going around. Yesterday against Ketimanovic, oh my god! Like it, it it's over. completely like turned his you know ceiling upside down because it just allowing him to play that front foot tennis that he liked anyway. Yeah, he was just just all the time. Busting Ketimanovic like on serve yeah. and on, in the tie break. I mean, he was he was really good yesterday. And he's also yeah. grown a lot as like a much. I don't player. think Ketimanovic did much wrong to be honest. Yeah. yeah. From from what I've seen later on, when I uh, when I caught some replay and replay, uh, you know, in the morning, when I caught some, re- well, it was brief, but still, like from what I've seen, it was, yeah, just keeps on playing the match of his life. Really, yeah, it's yeah. more of a question like whether he can actually play at this level reliably and consistently right now. I, I have no clue about that, but uh, yeah. definitely that surface because- completely changed him, and also the way he's just um, actually playing, you know well tactically at the moment today he had a tough one with lestien he goes down a break in the second set and there's like the wind there's you know the the whole junk ball fiesta that lestien brings to the court and he also handles it pretty well so well, yeah. I, I, I would definitely be interested in that match of giron and i don't think he's guaranteed to lose this or manarino um yeah giron probably since giron is four one up mm. in the third so there's two Mickelson previews that I've did for tennis one. One was last week against Tiafoe, mm-hmm. where I thought, oh, you know, Francis has looked good since the US Open. This could actually be kind of a danger match for him. And then actually Francis comes out and kind of plays a very good match. And then and then this time, I thought the match against Kokinakis would be really tight. And mm. I thought that maybe, you know, Mickelson is like a 55-45 favorite. That's what I remember saying. And then he yeah, just with was... Kokinakis, I can't really get on board with that. However, with uh, Tiafoe, I was definitely right there with you. Like, I, I think I called it on, um, maybe it was ATP Weekly or whatever it was. I think I called it a 50-50 match. Yeah. Uh, Kokinakis, I guess it's maybe I just thought that he qualified and maybe, you know, he could make it more competitive. I still picked Mickelson to win, but I just I thought the scoreline would be yeah bad, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that was one of the last matches as well, right? That was the last match yesterday, so I didn't watch it. I, I woke yeah, up to that result. A couple of and I was sloppy surprised. service games yeah. that really cost Kokinakis, and of course Mickelson was, yeah, I mean, just continuation of... Yeah, I was definitely game. hoping for Alex to win because, yeah, Tanasi just hasn't been impressive at all, and, you know, seems like he's kind of, well, yeah, he's I don't know, good, reached his you know, ceiling probably yeah. is a stretch. However, yeah, he's kind of stagnated. He's, and, he's uh, like Mikkelsen, old, of course, he's like hasn't. Sort of 75 to 90 range, and he's kind of just been there. Like Actually, even in 2022, I mean, he had that one title in Adelaide, but then really, like, didn't really... Yeah, he actually, I don't think he got his career high until this year, right? Like, he didn't get to his career high until this year, I think. Uh, yeah, 65, right? Item. 65, yeah. I think, is his career. Yeah, I mean, because like, it was like 68 for years. It was like 68 mm-hmm. since 2015 or 16 or whatever it was. And I think even with that title in 2022, he didn't get there because he literally won that title and then did nothing for the rest of the year. Last year was a little better, uh, but um, still still not, not amazing as a whole. And right now he lost a lot of matches in that part of the season. He kind of has to thrive in so so yeah i was hoping for a mickelson win but waking up to a 6162 definitely surprised me as well uh that's another you know just backhand that makes you want to go what uh, from Favrinka, yeah. but yeah he makes it down the line this time oh that's just poetry in motion oh that was the caption that triggered all <laughs> <laughs> poetry in motion yeah yeah i guess i guess that's overdue but like hey for something like i mean some of them yeah i guess it's it really does make you sort of go well but I mean, yeah, this shot obviously is so aesthetically pleasing, and mm. I, I totally get why people like the Vavrinka back. And mm. I don't think it's a, a, as essential. In also, his if you're a social media form. admin and you see that you know these posts uh-huh. are doing really well, I mean, you're gonna kind of keep doing it, right? Because, well, that's what the people want. 
Texas A&M goes to yes. It's a it's a university. I don't know um, why you're asking. I guess I don't know if it, is it a popular university <laughs> because I I don't I don't know. I just know it from tennis. You know, yeah, there. I mean, it's, it's somewhat. I, I guess in Texas there are other bigger universities like University of Austin. That's a bigger one. You know, I mean, there's Dallas as well. There's, I mean, I guess it's people mostly just go there for sports. I mean, I, I'm, yeah, I, I, I can't, I, I don't know. That went to I, only, I, I legit just know it from NBA tennis. As well, but so. Yeah. Rinderneck, of course. And I of think course, college tennis like, is actually not very big at all in the US. I mean, neither is tennis generally, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Especially college tennis, unfortunately. Although, I mean, it is now on e- available on ESPN Plus. So, and and I think Crack Rackets are doing a really good job covering it. So, definitely, they're like the people to go to for college tennis. Anything related to that? So, yeah. Sometimes there are these very random universities, but at least in terms of tennis, Texas A&M doesn't seem to be one. Um, mm. Rinderneck, I think Vashro as well, maybe. So. Ooh. Yeah, okay. Okay, so he's at 30 all here, and that was a, a good finish. And... I think tennis would be better to watch if they banned two handers, says Sean. That's a wild question, huh? Probably not, <laughs> uh, no. I never I never thought of that. Like would it be better to watch? Mm. No, you still need two handers there. I mean you need I like um... one handers, you know. Maybe maybe for me it would be better to watch. Like if we if we just found yeah, a group see, uh, of players who would make up the tour, the you know. I mean, do you want to see them go up against each other? One handers are still different, you know. Like, like, not every one hander is the same. Still, maybe during the off season they just come up with like an exhibition league or some kind of thing, and just like <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, one handers. How about Songa how about instead me. of uh, me, I mean, UTS? Maybe UTS can do a one handed one hander UTS edition. I don't know. Although that's I think actually, that's actually an ex- a great right? a, a great idea for for yeah for an exhibition competition. Yeah. I think if if we just instead of you know two thousand professional players, um, what <laughs> two 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 thousand professional tennis players right now, if we just landed you know two thousand professional tennis players with one handers, I think I would probably. Uh, then again, like one handers right now, you're like wow because they're rare, right? And if you mm-hmm. if, if it was just everyone playing a one hander, like would Ricardo Bonadio still feel special, for example? Would I mean, Jeremy Jan like, feel, you feel you special? Have to do an exhibition where you could get like I don't know sixteen to twenty players. Like inside the top two hundred, there must be at least fifteen one handers. I mean, I don't know. I'm just just to talk the top of my head. I think there's but, like ten in the one in the top one hundred or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Although Gasca has recently fallen out. Hmm. Yeah, why don't I just do that? That would be kind of a good idea for an exhibition. No, no, for get, an exhibition, it's get, a great idea. Get Federer yeah. back in there as well. You know, he can play a match or two. No, no, I, I would like to see just the players that play uh, two handers playing one handers for an exhibition event. Oh, so you want two handers in there? No, I want players who usually play two handers. Oh, two two play one hand. Okay, I see. Two play saying. one handers. Okay. No, that would be fun. That Songa would, be would fun. win. Uh, Steve Johnson would be really good. <laughs> oh, Steve Johnson. <laughs> yeah, Steve Johnson is really hit a two hander back then. Yeah, and then he's kind of <laughs> like sometimes in his career he has been switching from a one hander to two hander. So mm-hmm. I think Fuchovic as well would be really good. He's hit some ridiculous one handers. Um, Murray would be quite good, I think. I don't know. I've never really seen him, I guess, hitting a one hander. But I mean, maybe. he could just hit exclusively slice, but then you'd have to just keep yeah. running, running. But yeah, you know. Depends on the surface. Murray Thompson, definitely, if it was grass. 
Oh wow, I mean that's such a stunning point now from from Jari, and as he's really not sort of bothering with the serve it out idea, he's just trying to go for it as much as possible here and close out the second set. Uh, probably not thinking about it, but if he closes it out here, he's gonna serve first in the decider. <laughs> Yeah. I have to bring it up every time. I know, I know. But just that <laughs> what it says, according to all the data that he has looked at, that there is no actual statistical difference. But psychologically, yeah. There, do, do you think Nicolas like Jari it. cares more about serving first in the decider or about getting his 100th to level win? <laughs> <laughs> For me, neither of those things are even in the top 10 things that are on his mind right now. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> What's the top one thing on his mind right now? How do I beat this old prick? <laughs> Probably the next point, right? Uh, that's kind of optimistic, but yeah, it should be the next point. <laughs> He's cracking some forehands here. Again, Stan kind of just willing to trade for, with him just a meter or two behind the baseline, even on serve now. And Jari's just oh, crushing his the forehand. Was. The yeah, moment. yeah, yeah. That's where I heard it. Anchorman. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I said you remember that reference now. And I actually yeah. remember this also because Andy Murray was coming to the San Diego Open and he did like an impression of Ron Burgundy. Mm. It's pretty funny. Mm. Ooh. Yeah, and that's a pretty nasty one-hander from Vavrinka into the net. So 6-2 Jari, and indeed he's going to start the decider on serve. Mm. Yeah, Ghosty wants a tournament between Zverev, Kyrgios, Basilashvili, Saibovni. No. I'm running out of options by now. Thankfully, I'm running out of options by now. Yeah, that's four of them. But yeah, yeah, I would I would like to see you know something extremely weird. So like yeah, the two hander guys play one handers, the one hander guys play play two handers, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, just see see who's gonna be good at that. That would be pretty hilarious, especially if someone suddenly you know after that tournament actually realized that oh wait, I I, I maybe I'm gonna switch, you know. <laughs> oh, Corinth and Mute, by the way, right? Your Montes will find a way to get disqualified again. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It's Gal, just like going both for him in these exhibitions, the Labor Cup, and then now this, just some of the other thing happening. Yeah, guy does kind of doesn't have a slice, I guess. So, well, at least not like mm, neutral slice. But um, Corentin Mute, where would he even qualify? Right? Like, is he is he a two hander? Is he one hander? Right now, who right knows? Now a one hander, right? Yeah, but like, um, where would you put him in a competition like that, right? I guess he's banned <laughs> from that. Well, yeah, this set sped things up a little bit. We're probably not going to be here for three hours, however. Let's see if Stan Wawrinka has more in the tank. I don't know if he was like very flat or not in the second set, but maybe especially towards the end, it did kind of feel like he went down on energy or at least wasn't like actually pushing for that much of the ground anymore. Yeah. I mean, they used to be a where Stan would just get better as longer the, longer the matches went, he would just get better. Yeah. Especially at the slums. Lose the first set and then just blow away mm -hmm. the opponent in the next three. Marcos Giron, by the way, 6-1 in the third set. So eventually he wow. bagels and breaks sticks, Manarino. And he gets to that quarterfinal where, as you said earlier, he's going to play Patrick Kipson. One more match to my, to, today in Delray Beach. Taylor Fritz against Nuno Borges. Yeah, that's actually not, guess... a, that's not an easy first round, though. I mean, for a 250. We'll see. Yeah. Then again, you know, if you think about it, like Nuno still hasn't made a quarter ever. So... Um, yeah, it would be a big win for him. Let's say that. However, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, let's see how Fritz is health-wise as well, because he was kind of injured post post the Australian Open, obviously against Djokovic already. He was, but then also, oh, in, well, okay, yeah, yeah, he was struggling at least. And yeah, but then, then he played he played Davis Cup, right? 
he played, but he didn't play as number one or number two. He was like oh, okay. uh, still nursing something, and he played against Vladislav Orlov in the mm -hmm. Dead Rubber. So, um, was he yeah, playing that's for De Dallas, or was that just maybe? Okay, no, I guess he wasn't. Oh, was he planning Dallas? I, I don't I actually don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. That. I don't actually like, know. Yeah, I can see he if he went through really... from the intro list, but uh, last year he was right. Um, yeah. But I don't see him. At least he but didn't I, I, withdraw. I think, yeah. Per se. I, no, I think maybe he didn't. Maybe he felt like he just needed a bit more time after Davis Cup. Yeah, it, it's interesting because, like, for example, Shelton also is in Delray, right? It's like hmm, kind of oh. surprising to me that they're. A bit picky, but maybe for Taylor Fritz, you know, it's it's a it's a new uh, <laughs> version of him as well. You know, someone who's gonna be a bit more um, like not gonna play two fifties every week. Who knows? But of course, he did start actually pretty well at the Australian Open, much better than expected. Yeah, because last year he lost second round to Popper, and so it made sense yeah. to get more matches. And the defending champion as well in Delray. So yeah, I kind of feel good about his chances to well. To win to today and it. probably also to win the title, yeah. Yeah. Provided everything is fine. Uh, I didn't see that much against Orlov in Davis Cup, but no. well, it was definitely more comfortable than uh, Korda's win over Oleksii Krutik. No, that was <laughs> that, that, that's for sure. Korda was yeah. That's that's Korda right now. Yeah, I know. He's just spraying the ball everywhere on the forehand. And there was that match against Dimitrov also last week where he. he had an edge in the second set tie break, and then he just throws it away with a bunch of sprays for hands. Yeah, he can lose to anyone right now. He's wildly out of rhythm, confidence. Like he'll he'll show patches of his old January yeah. and himself, and it'll just be like, oh wow, this guy could be top five. And then you know the next point. The I next was thinking he can play. he can beat the minor in Rotterdam, but like, yeah, that was a bit of a no show. And I, I know he won like seven games, but it just wasn't exactly I what I was expecting. In from going him, into that match. I thought I thought Diminor was gonna win in straights. Yeah, but he has such him. good he has such good tools to beat Diminor to me. Like the the way he uses the shorter angles, the way he can, you yeah. know, approach the net out of yeah. nowhere. Uh, yeah. I thought that's a very good combination on the minor and maybe even specifically on like a slower record like that. Just just yeah. yeah, I thought it would open up a lot of possibilities for him. But honestly, like even though he won seven games, he was all the time like fighting for his life there. Every single service game of Korda would be, you know, the minor having free break points and and Korda either barely surviving or just don't, no, just not. So yeah. By the way, is Diminor the new Schwartzman in terms of return? As I'm saying that because I'm saying that because literally his return stats are so good. Like he's breaking serve like one out of every three times. I, I haven't checked that up actually, but well, well. I'll see. We'll see if that continues. But like, honestly, it's getting to like Schwartzman level, and he has a better serve. So <laughs> maybe this is his peak. Maybe it's maybe his peak is higher than I thought it was. Let's put it that way. Maybe it's like not actually fringes of. Maybe he can be like. Eight in the world. We'll see. There was a, a moment when he broke the top ten, and a friend of mine on a on a group chat, I remember, was saying that, like something about like credit to him for like fully maximizing his potential, and I was like, well, really, is that? I don't the think maximum? so. I think he can get. I, like, think I don't maybe, think it's I the think maximum. He can be better. I think he can be better yeah. than this. Like I don't think this is his max. <laughs> I think really, you know, getting to the top ten, let's say a fringe top ten level, like that's expected like yeah, that that's yeah, that's yeah. the sort of expected result for the minor it's 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 nothing crazy it's nothing that's stronger than what he had in store right. i mean the guy has been you know what a to top 30 player for what five six years now i think and he was he's... 18 in the world or something in 2019 so like yeah, yeah. i mean he's never gonna fall out really because there's no you know other than injury there's no real way of for him to yeah. do that so so i think you know getting to the top 10 at some point is just really not nothing close to like his maximal potential i i don't think it's high you know either like i don't think it's going to be you know a top five game or something unless unless the, yeah, i could see him the, hitting seven or eight you know I yeah guess. rankings are relative right but like at least you know in terms of winning big titles i still don't think it's gonna happen for him really mm -hmm. outside of like maybe a random um, thousand that 
blows out blows up somewhere he can do it for sure but yeah. um yeah as a whole i was just surprised about that comment because to me it's it's nothing you know of note really that the minor got to the top 10 like this is really sort of expected with his actually there's two people also who made the 2020 us open quarter final i was thinking this yesterday who is gonna is that like are they ever gonna repeat a result like that again i mean are they ever gonna get to a quarter or semi uh-huh. Chorich and Diminor. Does that mean Chorich was like 12th? Yeah. 12th and, uh, yeah, 12th is his career high, and he got to the 2020 quarterfinal as well. But actually, he won the biggest title, you know. He already won. He already he won the the, but, yeah. yeah, he's another one who is... In, in a very different moment of his career, he won yeah. the, that Masters rather than the... Um, rather than when he was the highest in the rankings. And I guess it makes sense. Like he's such a, you know, a much better server now. He had a couple of these events when he was actually proactive on the forehead as well. Yeah, that forehead. But, um, yeah, like Prismich is going to be a better Chorich, I think. Mm, yeah. His forehead still, not, still not a very explosive ceiling, but like it's, it's a very similar game. It's a very similar sort of foundation. That There's a better comparison from. than the Djokovic comparisons I've been hearing. So, yeah, see that. I think especially while, after you watch that Novak match against, uh, you know, the, the match against Novak at the Australian Open, like that's kind of when it really hits you that Prismich is really sort of very similar to Chorich at 18, for example. Mm. And it's, it's not going to be super easy for him to like advance in the rankings right now, but um, eventually I... Maybe Chorich is his idol. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That'd be really funny if he came out and said, Born and Chorich is my idol. <laughs> uh, Max Kashnikovsky actually uh, always says that Bernabe Zapata Miralesh is his idol. Who? Who says that? Max Kashnikovsky, the Polish player who recently won his first challenger title. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure you, you have heard of yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. That's why I, I, have you know, I just, I just threw, threw the name out because I'm pretty sure you've heard of him. And he always says that Bernabe Zapata Miralesh. And as well, some uh, recently, you know, Ayrash, he mentioned João Souza after he beat him. I, mm. I've never, I, I haven't heard Souza before, but I've heard Zapata Miralesh. Max talks about him all the time. He basically says that he respects his, you know, his greed, his hard work and, and, and the the effort. Um, honestly, it makes sense. Like Zapata Miralesh is such a, just such a humble hard worker, right? That it, I, I kind of get it. I mean, it's still very random, you know? Usually you're not going to hear people say that their tennis idol is Zapata Miralesh, but um, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've heard it so many times, honestly, from Max by now that I'm not... I don't really treat it as something special anymore. But um, when he said that at, that at one of the press conferences in in Oeiras, uh, I think Jose Morgado tweeted about this and like uh, a few other people. Like yeah. for, for me, it's like you know old news by now because really Max talks about Zapata Miralesh all the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean he's only twenty, right, Max? Um, Two thousand three, yeah. Hmm. Actually, in the quarters this week already in uh, Bengaluru. Of course, that's going to be um, tomorrow. Uh, no, no, I mean... Yeah, because I, mean, I saw there was this, like, right. all-Polish match in the time <laughs> recently in Belgium. Yeah, yeah. He I think that was during the Australian Shack. Open. Yeah, you, yeah, because you lost uh, to... That's second week of the Australian Open, yes. Right. And that was actually the Polish, Polish number two and number three for Davis Cup against Uzbekistan as well. But eventually, he, Max the calendar that he won was that in Portugal? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And he beat he he beat Souza along the way there, right? Yes. 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 Okay, like second round that's, or quarter. That's probably when I had saw the Jose tweet. That's how they tweeted about it. Yeah. Yeah. It was like second round or quarters, he beat uh, Souza, and the final he beat Gusto Elias. That was mm. his first challenge title. First final was at the end of last year against Klein in Ortisei, and he had two match points there. Right. I don't know if you remember the um, doubles uh, specialist Alex Oliaxand Bure or whatever his first name was. Uh, he was in the top 100 a few years ago, but he's now his coach. Alex Bury? 
Um, Alexander, I think, was his name. Whatever. Yeah, Bure, uh, the Belarusian. Yeah, I don't the... think I ever watched him play, but yeah. But... Yeah. I actually saw him live. It was like one of his last matches. And, you know, at the time, it didn't seem like it would be because he was like 30, but he retired super early. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, now he's Max's coach. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a weird call, I guess. You know, a double specialist as your coach, but he like brings out the aggression, I guess. And that's, that's good. Let's see if Wawrinka can bring out the aggression in this game. And he's low 30, he's fairly low up again. Uh, let's see, especially how he uh, sort of tackles the returns now, right? Because the last time he was in a position like this, he was super passive. Yeah. And he well, just he's allowed being, he was very aggressive in the love 15 point. Like that was exactly yeah. the kind of tennis that... And especially as it's going to be the second serve now, we're going to know a lot after, you know, sort of how quickly Vavrinka can get back to the baseline after the return, let's say. Yeah. I mean, I have very mixed feelings about this. <laughs> I'm going to see it in a moment. But basically, there's like this moonball-ish shot, which I don't think is fully clean from Vavrinka, but it allows him to get back to the baseline. <laughs> Let me see the second serve. Let's see what he does here. Love 30. Oh. Whoa. Yeah, that was... I don't know that allows going. him to get back to the baseline, right? Like yeah, that's that was, literally what gives him. Perfect. The I don't know if that's what he was going for, but that was wow. No clue if was. that's what he was going for. Yeah, I, but yeah, worked out absolutely perfect. I mean, wow. after that looper, after that loopy yeah. shot, Vavrinka steps into the court, hits the big forehand, and he has three break points now. Mm-hmm. Let's see if you can take it. Actually, Alcaraz versus Vavrinka would be a very fun semifinal to watch. <laughs> I'm just laughing now because uh, Ghosty, of course, when we were talking about Korda, had to be there uh, in the chat. He yeah. absolutely loafs <laughs> and not loves, no, loafs uh, Sebastian Korda. Yeah. Ooh. What was that? Yeah, that, that slice died for some reason. Yeah. That that could have been like a very possible opportunity for mm-hmm. for Vavrinka, but not possible in the sense that he could pass on it, but he could pass Jari and um yeah, the ball for some reason really friend of mine like an hour ago I see was also texting about the the courts producing some very awkward bounces and yeah mm. <laughs> we just, a lot in this match <laughs> yeah especially the drop shots like they, they really tend to jump around yeah I guess Jari is also kind of going for it I mean the the way he uh sliced the ball on the on the next shot here uh, you know on the next point you're also gonna see an, another like slice approach and it's not even that like well placed or something but I think he's kind of banking on it you know that the the ball might have a bit of an uncomfortable bounce he's having to hit second serves on a lot of these points yeah, it was the same with the previous, right? Um, low 30 opportunity. I mean, of course, this time it was a low 40, oh, actually. So Stan tried to go for the lob there. Interesting yeah. choice. I think he might have been better off just ripping that back and going straight at Jari there and getting another passable opportunity. But, ooh. Yeah, but I guess it also kind of stayed low and Jari came forward. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't think he considered that ripping of thing to be an option here. Yeah. Um, of that sh- lower slice approach. And 
Yeah, when it's I saw really the replay, I'm like, whoa, that's nice actually really like Yeah. Th- that 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 that's why I said that like Jari is kind of banking on it being a bit kind of comfortable, I think, right now. He's won yeah. literally won two of the last three points oh, of really? no, nice I approaches. Just, no, the umpire's coming down to chip the mark. Let's yeah. See. This could be a very big game in the match, so this Oh, okay. Let's see what happens here. Another second serve. Let's see if he can get back up on the baseline. And basically, that's all I'm watching for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not quite yet. We're like five shots into this rally. When... Mm, another point where Jari's just going to come forward, but this time on the forehand, and this time Bovringa actually does go for the pass. And yeah, he gets Hits it pretty well. Makes Jari hit a really tough backhand volley. Forces the error. Yeah. A lot of the time it feels like Favrinka is returning the first serve better than the second. Yeah, for sure. He's really losing a lot of these serves. He's losing a ton of second serve points. Like, more than you would expect. Uh, But, like, they're actually that forehand defensive squash shot, whatever you want to call it, actually really helped him out there. And this is his fourth breakpoint chance. And I guess I can see he already took it, but now I'm going to see the breakpoint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the scoreboard is pretty fast. I've already seen it too. So th- this was a rare example of when that uh, heavy return actually gives him the point in a way. Uh, well, I would still classify it as an unforced error on Jerry's yeah. side, but. But yeah, it makes sense Like with what we said just a second ago that the first serve and second serve percentages of points won for Jari are fairly close, actually, you know, 69 to 57, because Pavrinka is really losing a lot of second serve um, return points. Uh, of course, it's still going to be higher on the first serve for Jari because, well, he's going to get the aces, he's going to get the unreturned serves, but like Stan really fares better just blocking the return rather than going for that, you know heavy second serve return strat because then he's so far behind yeah uh but um, uh, eventually of course he does land the break so uh, maybe it's not gonna matter but yeah Vavrinka actually has only lost five points behind his first serve the whole match yeah 28 yeah. out of 33 wow. still at, at, at a 50 percent rate of landing it hmm. you know it kind of evens out but, yeah, he uh, was at he was at forty eight percent for seven in the second set. Yeah, I mean he he's just going for it, of course, and uh, yeah, I mean probably worth worth it in the long run here. I have actually not played on traditional European clay more than once. I played it once, and but it's in the, in the states. Um, actually, where they have the San Diego Open, they have a, this new red clay courts there. Played there once, but. I don't think it was the same. I didn't really like the courts that much. And then I've only played on synthetic or green clay. So I guess technically no, not as much as you and Damien. You guys play a ton on clay. Yeah. And as you as you might expect, I've never played on green clay, synthetic clay, hard shoe, whatever. So yeah. I haven't played on real grass yet either. Definitely yeah. hoping to do it at some point. We have a couple of grass courts in Poland now. So when you're in line at Wimbledon for the queue, then they have this, like, you know, for kids you can play like mini tennis Mm -hmm. and those courts are yeah like my modern grass courts ish i guess so i played on those while i was waiting in line for the queue in 2018 was that when you were (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah, i know what you're gonna say at wimbledon's for the semi-finals (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah yeah no um i also haven't played on carpet uh, so my actually my surface uh, sort of knowledge is not that strong. I mean it's only really indoor hard, indoor it's clay. I guess a live clay outdoor court hard, tournament. Outdoor clay. Hmm? I still haven't been to, to see um, a clay court tournament live, so it's uh-huh. I'm like way and back. and I actually for a long while had no outdoor hard live experiences because it's not oh, wow. that common in Europe. Okay, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Like on the Challenger Tour, I think there's like. Well, that, right now there are there are a lot more, but I think a, a year or two ago there was like ten events maybe outdoor hard in Europe, and uh, mm-hmm. actually that was you know when they introduced also the challenge in Kozarki in Poland, and that's when I saw 
uh, outdoor an outdoor hardcore event for the first time because mm. in Poland it's always clay in the summer and then in the you mm. know the winter well in the winter there's no events in Poland but foreign events would play indoors so um, yeah it actually took me a long while to see an outdoor hard event so it's it's pretty funny how our uh, sort of surface well not preferences but the surfaces that we watched or played on are kind of swapped. Yeah, I haven't seen indoor yet either, so I haven't seen indoor hard or you okay. know, outdoor clay. I guess Miles saw indoor and outdoor hard in back to back weeks. So yeah. he has that on his. Yeah, but also Delray is actually pretty pretty different from each other, so he does have some some nice variety there. Hmm. Ghosty to coach Pergola. Look at that. No, she's submitting her resume. <laughs> yeah. Definitely one of the surprising, uh, you know, partnerships that didn't work. But we'll see. Pagula is in a little bit of a slump right now. Well, this year only, right? Like the, yeah. the previous season, she still ended on a, on a high note. Well, if you can call a high note getting demolished in the final <laughs> of the WTA finals, but it's still yeah. the final of the WTA finals. Sure. I think she's supposed to come back in San Diego, so we'll see then. Oh. Well, I mean, and so is Mukova, actually. So hopefully... Well, we'll Mukova see. might still delay her yeah. comeback, right? I, yeah. I, I think she probably will. It doesn't look very likely at this point. Of course, we also have Wozniacki coming back for San Diego. But I haven't yeah. even seen the, the entry list because it's just so rough on the WTA side and you actually have to go through you know, some painful steps to find it. And, yeah. yeah. It'll be quite something on Twitter when we see Pagula and Navarro play each other. I saw something uh, yesterday about Emma Navarro as well, and uh, you know the, a similar topic. And I think it was in fact uh, James from uh, TikTok Tennis who raised it on Twitter, and mm -hmm. it was like John sometimes says this that um, he he sees people sort of outraged about some people, you know, some other people's opinions. But this opinion actually isn't really floating around. Like they kind of invent that it's floating around. And to me, the same, uh, it was kind of the same with that post from James because he was like, okay, so I have to sort of talk about that because people are, are mentioning that Emma Navarro is so rich apparently and okay. that uh, that he has to sort of talk about this because uh, even though, you know, she has the talent and like everything and the hard work of course matters as well, she definitely had more time and opportunity to develop her game. Um, and I, I was reading that and I was just like, this is literally the first time I'm seeing Emma Navarro's background being mentioned anywhere. <laughs> wait, um, you didn't, I mean, like, wasn't it talked about at some point last year, like when at the end of the year? No? I mean, I, I, I was but, definitely talking about her game. I was definitely talking about the fact that, you know, she had these big runs. At I the, mean, I think um, it was known already like a year or two ago with but, the Charleston tournament, like when she was getting the wild card to play there. And then everyone was, everyone knew like her dad was a billionaire, uh, right? Because he owned the whole, and then he actually was going to move Cincinnati as well. So maybe I heard about it in like 2022, but then I just never cared about it enough yeah, to remember probably, it. Probably, probably, and she but, wasn't really like that relevant until probably... You know, yeah, late last year, year, really. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, second half of last year, let's say. Actually, it was it was San Diego where like she actually. Yeah, yeah, it was San Diego. Yes, yeah. yes, I can give you yes. that. It was. It, it was, was semi final of San Diego. Okay, lost to Kenny. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the best <laughs> event, the, there, the best event there, on the calendar. Right? It's all happening in San Diego. Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you, it's all in San Diego. No one watches it, but it, it all happens in San Diego. You know. No, but I, I was just like, you know, thinking, uh, do, do people really bring it up that much? Uh, but anyway, that's, yeah. a, that's of course... There's a, definitely a topics like note. that for sure. That, yeah, I mean, we see that this an unpopular... Like, there's so many that are like, it's like, oh, the unpopular opinion, but then it's like, oh, it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just a, just a day or two ago, there was this viral tweet which literally said unpopular opinion and it got like a billion likes and the opinion in it was not unpopular at all. Like it was 
literally the sensible opinion. I don't remember what it was, but okay. um, yeah, it, it, it got me. It got me laughing for sure. That people actually believe, you know, sometimes their opinions are unpopular, but they're just saying the most ridiculous, like the the, the most obvious stuff. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, we have Stan Wawrinka serving at 3-2. Break advantage he has built up for himself. All he has to do now is to maintain it. And of course, if he can keep landing these first serves, that will be helpful given his stats so far in the match. Yes, Taylor Fritz started already. Yes, four games in. I'm not going to watch it, though. I'm definitely going to bed after Jari Vavrinka. Got to be up tomorrow for the challengers. <laughs> You're not going to watch a top five ball striker? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pretty funny, yeah. Um, I guess I'm going to have more time to watch him, you know, during the week, hopefully. Yeah, probably. But, yeah. I guess the challengers also don't start that, well, 7.30 in the morning for me, so... <clears throat> Four hours, four and a half hours from here. There's Walton on clean, but uh, on clam. But I think I can skip Walton on clam. You know, <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna regret it. Although Manchik at nine a.m. Well, that's that's better. That's better. Manchik might feasibly break the top one hundred this week um, if he wins the title. And well, he is probably the main favorite right now for Manama. Eh, it can get quite tricky, but like especially through Haiti tomorrow, he should be beating. It's a good mix of uh, veterans and youngsters, though. You've got Trunheiti Menshik, Kukushkin Shalbach, Jumhur Rincon, and Gaska Bidiharis. And I guess only Gaska Bidiharis, uh, you know, is, is kind of a not a youngster, but Bidiharis is still a bit of a youngster to me because, well, he kind of emerged, you know, from the depths of the ITF tour so recently. And of course, when it comes to Richard Gasquet, he's still like nine years younger than him. <laughs> yeah. But everyone is younger than Richard Gasquet right now, uh, besides Stan Wawrinka, I think. I think Stan Wawrinka is actually older than Richard Yeah, Gasquet. Stan is older. Manama... Uh, yeah, shall I be the Fonini? Yeah. Uh, Fabio served for the match and then had a complete, complete meltdown. <laughs> And that was, of course, the tournament of um, that was the tournament last year, basically when um, Shelbach had his big breakthrough with the final in Manama, beating Kubler along the way, and then eventually losing to Tanasi Kokinakis. Uh, makes the top hundred this year or next year? No, I or don't never. think it's going to happen this year. Or I think at year. some point in the future it's going to happen. Yeah, but uh, I don't think it's going to happen yeah. this year. Uh, I think mm -hmm. next year is is believable. Um, he kind of suffers from a lot of the same issues that like players with yeah unique game styles have. I think where if you land someone who's like just well equipped to handle you, then it's hard for you to beat them. Like someone That's who true. doesn't fall for the mm -hmm. bag of tricks, you know. But you I don't know. know. For example, like you have Gaston who's like made it, and then that kind yeah, of yeah. like you know if Gaston can do it, I mean. I know yeah, I mean, at, at some point he'll get there. At some point he'll get there. And like Gaston is also like in and out of the top 100, right? Like he's not yeah. fully there and he's probably never going to be. It might Lest take Yannick Chabai longer can, to get there, but when he gets there, I think he'll actually stay there a little longer. Dan Gaston, yeah. He's, yeah. he's going to have a better shot at staying. I, he might be like, I, I don't think he's going to wait as, as long as Lestien did, but in the sense mm -hmm. that Lestien is now kind of like, he's not comfortably in the top 100 but like when he yeah. was in trouble last year in 2023 you know the first half of the season he barely wins a match then he just drops down to the challengers wins three of them and he stays in the top 100 sort of right. at will and maybe that's like the future for Shelby that he like be you know confidently in 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 the sense that if he ever falls into trouble he just sort of drops down he wins an event and 
I don't know. So when you're when you're covering the challenger tour, do you ever look at the main tour and you you're like, why are these players not playing challengers? Like that. that Diego like, Schwartzman. Like really oh yeah, Schwartzman. But like apart from that, are there any other players that you're like, they should be playing challengers, but they're not, and maybe it's just a pride thing or an ego thing. Uh, like yeah, the main example right now is Diego Schwartzman for sure. But yeah. um, of course, this year they kind of changed up the point structure, so it has gotten a bit different. Like. It's it's more worth it often to play the ATP tour right now. Like for example, I was kind of expecting Nakashima to pull out of that Sherbrooke Paul swing, you know? Yeah. Um, because he has kind of done enough. He has I done enough to I just know he would like I didn't think he would play yeah. this week, you know, for instance, or even this week and next week. Like the, the yeah. he of course he was signed up for all these challengers, right? But after doing so great in the first month, like I think he's kind of done enough to earn a bit of a break, get back to the States, play, you know, whatever, Acapulco, Indian Wells, Miami, whatever. Yeah. Um, but 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 yeah, I think this year it's kind of changed where uh, there's going to be a lot more like talk about that. But let's say, for example, oh, um, there's definitely been a few players the last few years who kind of went the ATP qualifying route and it killed them. Timofe Skatov last year, for example. He had an excellent shot in the summer to break the top 100. He had nothing to defend. He was he started the year well, and he goes for the ATP qualifying route. He loses, like, seven consecutive qualifyings in a row, and right now he's ranked, like, what, 250 or something like that? Mm -hmm. uh, Giulio Zapieri, for example, he had two challengers to defend now. He goes to Rotterdam mm -hmm. qualies. I don't know, you know. I and think this can actually dropped because he made that semi in what was it, Umag? Yeah, uh, summer 2022. It was 2022, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, 2023. He he had he still has like a big gap between because he twisted his ankle in the Karlsruhe final, and then he was out for two months, so he has no points to defend for two months. However, he just dropped uh, Sherburg and Rovereto, and yeah, he tried. Rotterdam, he didn't qualify. He tried like Marseille, and I think he got in as a lucky loser and lost. And has he actually earned that many points? Uh, yeah. And and again, of course, next tournaments, he's also going Doha, Dubai, uh, Indian Wells. But I guess this year, yeah, we don't really know yet how to rate these decisions because, again, the round by round distribution is very different. But um, when it comes to Schwartzman, I have to say that this is just, um, I, I don't get the guy. Like, he comes out and he says, you know, if it's not going to start happening for me soon, I don't know how much I, I will have left. Like, it's not going to just happen for you out of nowhere, right? Like, you have to actually put in some effort. Like, you, you're not going to get better playing one match a week. And there were so many opportunities for Diego Schwartzman to pick up some confidence. For example, at the end of last year, there was that Brasilia Temuco altitude hard swing which is so weak because you literally get like 90 percent of the field is clay specialists and uh diego doesn't play it this year golden swing i understand that he's playing atp tour events right now because like that's you know that's one of his favorite parts of the season that's actually this should be a good hunting ground for him but why didn't he play punta del este or piracicaba two months two weeks earlier Literally because he's too prideful to do it. There's no other explanation. <laughs> Either too prideful or he's scared that if he goes down to that level and he puts himself there that he'll actually lose those matches too. I mean, yeah, it's possible. Uh, I would. I, I just feel like, you know, right now he's not really that much better, yes, than most challenger players. Um, a friend of mine actually just uh, yesterday we were talking about this and he said that Schwartzman right now kind of plays like a guy who would go to, down to the challenger level and grind past Alex Barena in three sets. I don't know if you know Alex Barena, but he's like, you know, let's say fringe ITF uh, challenger qualifying guy. And mm -hmm. um, I just said like, yeah, I agree. I think that's what would happen. But we kind of actually haven't seen him even do it, right? Like we mm -hmm. haven't even seen him grind Alex, grind past Alex Barena in two and a half hours. And yeah, I, I just don't think it's the way to go, really. I, I think that you cannot possibly expect to get better if you're playing matches like here against Puruchaga and Galan, losing them. It's not going to be mm -hmm. better in, suddenly, you know, just next week because you played, what, an hour and a half this week. <laughs> it's so weird, but maybe his best results are going to come on fast courts now. That was the case last year in 2023, yes. 
I mean, when, when his base end game lost like some of that yeah, and then fire. obviously Shanghai I know like you know it wasn't Fritz's best moment but he beat Fritz he beat no that um, was his best event of the of 2023 yeah. probably yeah. maybe alongside Ron Garros but yeah there was a big big chunk of that year when um, he was actually doing better in quicker conditions yeah absolutely yeah because like although if he doesn't then he's totally toast so he has to be more aggressive. I mean, the guy is like five losses away from retirement. He doesn't win a match yeah. until Ron Garros, and he's and I don't think he's gonna play anymore. That's what it looks like. Because yeah, if, if he's not willing to go down, if he's not willing to you know put in the hours away from the big stages, then really there's no way to recover if he loses the next five, six, seven matches. Yeah. Anyway, Stan Wawrinka, 5-3 up, so uh, two games to potentially clinch this match, one on the Jari serve first. As usual, I started talking about Diego Schwartzman not willing to play challengers. That's a popular topic with me recently. Yeah. But We got our Brandon Nakashima bit in, you know, we had to wait. <laughs> we got it right. in, so. And I think I did it, right? I, th- I think I did it. Not you even, yeah. Yeah. I, either way, one of us was gonna. So. Yeah, but it's usually you. It's bound to happen. We didn't mention his match from today. <laughs> I don't know yeah. for purpose or no. Not really relevant. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we can always say that you know the scheduling mm. choice was was pretty poor, and he didn't really you know his head wasn't in it, right? Yeah. It's maybe like it could be right like it, it, it's legit possible that he didn't really believe in playing these events anymore when he's already 90 which uh, again again i kind of was expecting him to pull out get an extended break and then try the atp tour again yeah he's, he's gonna be winning matches like he's gonna be qualifying for these events i think so yeah. Let's see if Nicolas Jari is going to be winning that 100th tour level, <laughs> tour level match. Uh, yeah. The eighth Chilean player to do so, potentially. The one yeah, with the highest yeah, round uh, of wins is his grandfather. He had an easy forehand to go up to have left 30 in the previous Wawrinka service game, but yeah, then he missed it. But, I mean, if he holds here, he still has a chance. Like in the sense where Brinka like might get tight and play a sloppy game. We'll see. Because actually that has been a thing with Stan. Like the older he's gotten, he hasn't been as clinical when it comes to finishing a lot of these matches. Maybe not quite as much as like a... Well, I was going to say Chilich, but you know. <laughs> Mari? Yeah, Mari even. Yeah, Mari is a good example, actually. Mm, well, right now, Jari is kind of... Yeah, right now, Jari is kind of battling to even give Vavrinka that chance to choke. By the way, Borges is up a break against Taylor. Yeah, I saw, I saw a tweet about the, the shot that he broke with. Apparently, it was just like, you know, this on the line, like barely, barely. Uh, but I don't know what the actual shot was. Vavrinka tries to go for the Jari here with the slice approach. And then it's actually Jari, you know, the, it's completely reversed because he goes for the lob. Uh, but unlike Vavrinka, he actually makes it and it's right on the baseline, right on the money as well with a, with Vavrinka clapping his racket.
Hmm. Wawrinka moves back again to take that second serve return and doesn't connect with it whatsoever. So it is going to have to be, uh, you know, he's going to have to serve it out eventually. 5-4 after 2 hours and 25 minutes on court Guillermo Vilas. That must be like, well, actually no, right? Wawrinka beat Nori at Davis Cup because I was thinking about like when did Wawrinka last uh, be the top, be the 20, top 20 player? Yeah, player, but, that must be but I guess on coin he hasn't done it since 2022. He mm -hmm. beat Opelka in Rome. Oh, Opelka Rome, yeah, yeah. I was actually writing that up uh, yesterday, I guess, but I forgot <laughs> already. <laughs> But, yeah, because uh, I remember last year in the swing he played like Fritz and Monte Carlo, and then he played. Yeah, Rube. he had the first tiebreak one, the, and he lost it. The Rube Rube one I remember because there was that funny like uh, pre-match. Uh, um, rock paper scissors. Rock, yeah. Paper, yes, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, the Fritz match he could have won. Yeah, Rome, well, he, he could have won the first set. I don't know if he could have won the match, but he could have won the first set. In the Monte Carlo, yes, against Fritz, he probably should have won the first set. Well, definitely should have won the first set, but I don't know if he would have won the match, right? Because yeah, who knows yeah. how much energy he has left. That tournament against I Rublev was it? Was it? I, I still think Monte Carlo is probably going to be Taylor Fritz's best uh, clay court tournament. That's probably the one that if he's going to make a final or even win, that would probably be the one. How about Madrid? I thought that too, but then you know, like controlling it, like it's a little hard. Like the it wasn't bad last year, you know. He yeah, lost a very could be Madrid. I, I could see it, that, but uh, triple Z. Perhaps, yeah. Madrid is just very random. Anything can really. Yeah, but n maybe now it's it's a bigger event as well. I don't know if that actually makes yeah. it tougher to make the final. I guess it does than Monte Carlo. It kind of does because Fritz is one of those players who's susceptible to early road losses because of yeah. his sort of unvaried play style like this match against Borges, is very dangerous one for him like this, yeah. this is what i was doing a preview for this today and i was like you know this is a match that actually i think it was maybe the odds were being too kind in terms of uh for, for fritz like it really does not feel like an 80 20 to me yeah he he does gift a lot of like big wins to players right like the yeah, uh, well, last Zizhen year, of course, Zhang, Zhang, Yiving Wu, Shef, uh, Shevchenko, Schwartzman, right? Like, that's that's not an accident. Like, it literally comes from, yeah, him being just a little too monotonous, I guess. Too predictable, yeah. But now he, now let's see, he has that forehand drop shot thing. Let's see if that works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's see if Stan Favrinka can close out yeah, because yeah. suddenly it's love 30 and... I yeah. can't really say he choked so far, no, but um, not so far, no. Things just aren't first, coming but, for him. We're, we're yeah. watching the second point. Let's see. Oh uh, yeah. Let me see. No, that's not a choke. That's just really good tennis from Dari so far. Yeah. But also, was Borg Borges was the first ever Portuguese player to make it to the fourth round of the Australian Open, right? That's Australia, yes, but not at a slam because yeah, Souza had a couple. Yeah. 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 Wimbledon and maybe US? Or... US, yeah, lost to Djokovic in 2018. But yeah, this one is. And Wimbledon, I guess, too. Like with Nadal? No? Yeah, Nadal, yeah. Nadal, yeah. Ooh. But now the now, now it's kind of a bit of Ooh. a choking effort. Um, I really was not sure if Obringo was going to close this out. Mm. That game ran away from him very, very quickly. Well, three or four years ago, I would have more faith, but... Mm. So he hasn't won a title since 2017. Since Geneva. Misha Zverev? Was, was yeah, that yeah. the one? <laughs> yes, Misha so Zverev. Misha Zverev beat Nishikori yeah. in the semi. Yeah. yeah. 
for some reason at Roland Garros, all the people who do well, well not, not all the people, but like many of the finalists who have made it, like have played the week before. And it's usually not been much of a... Yeah, like Team and Djokovic have sort of... Team and Djokovic, um, Wawrinka, Rude as well, right? I mean, so... Yes. Yeah, Rude as well. But then then again, like some of the best performers of Geneva usually are not going to do well at Roland Garros because the conditions are so different. Mm. But yeah, Djokovic team... Uh, Even Jari last team. year, he made the second week. Yeah, Jari made the second week, but it was like a pretty easy draw, right? So I think he... I don't remember who he played, but yeah, I think it was... Tommy Paul, who played an awful match in the second oh. round. Oh, yeah. And he didn't actually threaten Rude as much, sort of. In, of course, at Ron Garros compared to Geneva. But, like, I don't know, even even Ibing Wu or um, someone like that woke up for Geneva and then, of course, was awful at Ron Garros. Mm. Uh, but I guess the the other events usually... Well, of course, last year, Franz Rundo as well, right? He made the final in... Um, Leon, in yeah. Lyon, and then he was in the quarters of Ron Garros. Fields didn't Fortran. manage to do anything. Right? Because he lost to Runa in the I fourth. I don't think so. Yeah, fourth round. Because Runa, Runa Rude was a quarterfinal. Ah, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Why did I think it was a quarter? I mean, he was... Oh, no, no, no! It was definitely it was definitely a runa route. I wasn't really thinking about it. I was just like going off memory. Never mind. Yeah, that was so tragic. You forgot it. So yeah, I mean, um, the yeah, was, yeah. Runa route was was not great. It was so tragic that even your brilliant memory could not remember. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I don't know if I even watched it to be honest because I was just. After that seven dollar match, uh, yeah, I didn't believe. Yeah. Uh, maybe I watched the first set and then I just didn't believe that Holger was gonna turn it around. Any thoughts on Runa right now? Like uh, his coaching situation is where he's at in his career. Because there are definitely questions there. He's in a weird spot where, like, literally the best thing for him possible in the next month, two months, three months is to return to where he was early in 2023 like really literally return to where he was in 2023 and that's awesome already <laughs> so um yeah it it, it kind of means that for a year he hasn't progressed in any way and right. yeah of but course with the coaching the, situation it's yeah the it's coach thing weird. like with both severin and boris you know leaving him and they both they both made this statement where it was like uh scheduling or like it was a conflict in terms of not being able to be there yeah. but, but that's usually something you would kind of iron out beforehand right like that's not yeah i mean they should have known it beforehand yes like yeah, especially i don't know it's a big mess right now for sure yeah and then also he has a new age that is now gonna be um, managed by IMG, so which is not gonna be as fun for us because his Twitter thing was uh, was fun. Good times. <laughs> of course I think it was either his, his mom was running it or yeah. It was yeah, his mom was doing a lot of the work, yeah. Six five Jari in the meantime. And again he goes for that slice approach. To the Favrinka forehead and Stan just can't mm. even touch the ball. Like, I mean, how many times really? have we seen that play? Right, the slice down the yeah. line, and it just it just dies. You know. Yeah, and then it's not not like Favrinka's fault really most of the time. Yeah. And it's pretty smart from Jari to keep going there <laughs> because like by now it's it's clearly you know uh, him spotting that <laughs> the court is behaving a bit weird <laughs> when he goes for that shot. Yeah, some clay courts you just get really uneven bounces. I mean, most clay courts actually, that is just a thing. Yeah. 
Except for Madrid, which is just very hardcore ish. What do you think about the month of February in tennis? Is that like your most favorite month? Just because there's so much tennis. Yeah, I don't really have much, you know, in terms of like favorites because there's always a lot of tennis. Like even if there's, let's say, Indian Wells Miami, which can feel a little um, more, you know, void or whatever, there's still plenty of challengers. So I never really feel like there's not enough tennis. Okay, I guess wrong question. I meant tour level. I guess February is the busiest month. Which is yeah, like... yeah. February is the is the busiest month for sure. It's good for me money wise, <laughs> uh, and uh, when it comes to you know just interest, definitely it feels like there's something every day. And the last yeah. couple of weeks, I've enjoyed the fact that. And again, I'm going to mention challengers because, like, for me, it's just you know. Now I'm watching an ATP tour match in two hours. I'm going to be watching a challenger match, but what I'm what I'm trying to say is that I'm kind of enjoying the last couple of weeks because there's this like very clear breakdown. Well, with Rotterdam, it's not that clear, but uh, with challengers, like we have all everything in age in like East, um, the East or West, or oh, Jesus, I always have to think Western, West Asia and like uh, Europe. So basically you have India, you have Bahrain, you have uh, UK and you have France. So basically the challengers are like sort of earlier in the day and then later you kind of just have Buenos Aires and Delray. And I've been enjoying that the same last week where like the challengers are all earlier in the day. And then at night you can watch Cordoba, Dallas, you know, in my time zone at least. So, um, yeah, I've been enjoying the, sort of the, the split and how basically every single uh, hour, you know, whenever I want to watch tennis, there's always going to be tennis. <laughs> which uh, happens often. It's just rarely sort of that sort of structure. And uh, yeah, I guess in a way, February is definitely a good month for tennis. For like a fa for, for a tennis fan who likes, you know, at least the 250 level and like the players maybe that aren't usually, you know, headliners for the casual audience, it's definitely a great, great month. Yeah. I've been probably watching more WTA than ATP actually this month. Mm. Crazy enough. Interesting. Maybe it's just the matchups. And also for my job. Oh, and also time zone. <laughs> yeah, it just really allows to watch a lot of um, Doha in the morning when I wake up. And Rotterdam, mostly. <laughs> mostly Rotterdam and Doha this week. Uh, I can catch up a little bit of Delray in the evening. And the South American stuff in the afternoon. Yeah, there was literally a day last week, I think, when um, I, I woke up to watch, you know, India, Europe, then it went to uh, South America, North America, and I ended the day watching Australia. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. You know, it's it's good. You kind of feel like there's always something to do, which also can be a little um, tiring, I guess. But so far, yeah. I don't really feel like it. Do you, do you watch a lot of the ATP two hundred and fifty qualies? And 500 qualities, or do you just like sort of just look at those mm. results and you focus mostly on challengers? Like, it depends because I'm usually, um, weekends are usually busy for me, which uh, yeah. means that oftentimes I'm gonna be struggling to have time to watch a qualifying, qualifying for yeah. both challengers and ATPs. Yes, 
Yeah. So qualifying, it's usually like very yeah, there selective. Yeah, there's qualities for challenger as well. Budgets. I didn't even ask about that, but yeah. Yeah, challenger qualities is on, is on Sunday, and I usually miss it all completely just because I'm yeah. too focused on the finals and and everything. However, um, yeah, ATP qualifying just selected matches. Usually, when there's some you know exciting player who maybe hasn't played it before or whatever, right? I don't know. Last week there was, of course, um, well, last week, this week, sort of in Rotterdam, there was Thijs Bogard, right? The 15-year-olds so obviously watched that, but otherwise, even though there were some good matches, yeah, actually, qualifying is is what I usually miss, uh, especially especially challengers since it's just Sunday, right? Uh, Saturday on the ATP Tour, I guess, is a little more manageable. Favrinka saved that first match point with a big forehand, and it looks like right now he'll get another game point yeah. to get us to a tie break. Slice passing shot down the line, Sean said seven minutes ago, is an underused shot. Mm. It's generally tough to pass with a slice. Um, most of the time, it's just going to float. And... That's one where you'll see some one-handers have success occasionally. Yeah. But that's also, again, because of the reach and the grip and just... You know, you're Africa, out of the... you can't hit an open stance. You can't even get power on the... Yeah. if you're out of position so Vavrinka hit, hit one this this match right uh, a slice yeah. pass on the run it was a, a, a sli not on the run a slice pass down the line it wasn't like the most exciting one i've seen but he no. did but yeah overall it's it's kind of hard to like reliably you know consistently pass with the slice it's yeah. not um it's not meant for a passing shot like direct winner it's meant yeah for and, it, and it's no accident that players actually approach when they see you slicing like when they see that you have to slice that's Correct. when they're going to yeah. come in they have a lot of time to cut it off so basically you kind of have to surprise people with the direction i guess or yeah it's not easy to pull off a slice pass consistently mm. um Isn't slice with pace just a squash shot? Says Ghosty. It's a philosophical question, I guess, but but um, in a way, on the forehand at least, you can play a very fast squash shot slice. I mean, maybe. I like the joke about Dodge Challenger. <laughs> But yeah, this is this is the moment. This is the deciding tiebreak. Of course, Vavrinka had the, the five free chance, the five four, uh, you know, opportunity to serve it out. Jari having the one match point, but probably not that much to do on it. Yeah, with Vavrinka finding a nice forehand, I think inside in was or like maybe just cross really. Ooh, that's some. Deep return from Jari now as Favrinka will fall down the mini break right away. Well, pretty much right away. Um, there's been a, a couple more shanks as the match goes on from Stan. This time, of course, it's mostly created by the pace on the return rather than yeah, his tightness. It was at the left, so now I'm at the, at the second serve. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was the shank. And I guess what we've seen so from what we've seen so far in this match, making these first serves will be pretty key for Stan, especially in yeah. the breaker. Pretty much so. On the return, not that much of a difference if Jerry makes first or second. Oh, 
Oh, okay, Jari tried to be really aggressive on that second serve return, but he still has the mini break. <laughs> Oh, that was a good first serve return. Yeah, it did kind of sit up, so it's still on Jari that he missed it. But mm -hmm. yeah, right now, yeah, even yeah. just getting that ball back is, is at, least so important. Didn't, at least he got it behind the service. Yeah. At least around no man's land, so at least. Yeah, I mean, but let's see. I think I'm still going to give Jari an edge here. Probably would have said that before the tiebreak, to be honest, too, but... Guess he gets the easier points, generally, but... Yeah. Of course, you know, it's, it's a tiebreak. We're already having a chance once and not getting it done. Well, then... Jari also had a chance. <laughs> a match point, right? True, but... Um... Yeah, I mean, I guess Stan had it on his serve. Oh. Yeah, I mean, the, the next point kind of shows you why that previous return for Pavrinka was like, yeah, okay, good. I mean, it's good to return the first seven, but on clay, it does kind of sit up for you. And uh, even yeah, though he used the, he went for the trademark here, but... Yes, this was much more in... Jari's strike zone, and even though it was so deep, it didn't really matter because, well, it yeah. was like sitting up shoulder height, and Jari could just slam it for a winner inside out. And I guess we're at three match points, so I'm going to watch the point at 5 3 now. <laughs> Mm. Not that time. That was a good surf plus one and then a forehand volley finish. Mm. So I guess the, Stan also made one really sloppy forehand error at 2-3 when he got the break back. Yeah, uh, yeah. They lost him because they, then they were switching sides and it was 4-2 for... Yeah, she was like in full control of that point and just missed that incident yeah. or something. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was a big one. That was a big miss in the tiebreak, I would say. And also the shank had for it to get it to two love, but yeah. Yeah, that was a more so a deep return. Yeah. But let's see if he can hold on and win these two points. Yeah, Magnus has got a very worried look on his face right now. Magnus is one of the most calm coaches in the court in the box, huh? Usually. Yeah. Didn't, don't really see a lot of emotion from him. All right, the moment of truth. This must be a really long rally because I haven't seen the scoreboard move yet. Don't look at the scoreboard. Don't spoil it for you. Okay, I'm not gonna look at the scoreboard. I have another screen open now. Okay. <laughs> well, so it, it, it's it's not a long rally. It's not a long rally. <laughs> okay. I'm not gonna tell you who won, but it's not a long rally. I don't have that in front of me, so I'm just gonna watch it live now. I guess this is the fourth match point for Jari, because you had one before the tie break. Oh, and he finishes it off with a serve and forehand inside out winner. And I guess that was well deserved because he was definitely the better player in the third set tie break. And also, yeah, second set. I mean, now yeah, this could have been a, a top 20 win for Wawrinka if a few different things went another way, but. Wow, at the end, uh, Jari continues his good South American tennis swing form from from last year. I mean, it's still only one match, but yeah, he has a good chance to, I guess, a quarterfinal between Echeverry and Jari. Would you still pick Jari to win that? Not really. I I think it's close. I think Echeverry even beat Jari a couple of years ago in a semifinal in Mexico City. So like, you know, altitude clay, something that theoretically should be suiting uh, Jari more. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty close. Edge did play very well like the, the past couple of rounds, which I, is a bit of a change up because yeah, Cordoba and Davis Cup, he was off. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I would probably say Echeverry is a slight favorite to me. Now I'm checking the head to head. Now he's three and one against Jari, and um, of course the only match that he lost was the final in Santiago last year. That's the one that I remember. <laughs> I don't remember the others. Um, I don't think I watched. The that. others were the, Mex the 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 semifinal in Mexico City that I mentioned. There was also a first round in Cordoba, apparently in 2022. I don't remember okay. that either. And also a quarterfinal at the Campinas Challenger in 2021, which mm -hmm. I also don't really remember. Which um, well probably stems from the fact that it was six four six one, and I guess it just wasn't too memorable. Yeah, sure. uh, probably Jari at the time was not that much of a threat. That Mexico City semi, I remember though, that that felt very huge. Like that felt like a match for the title uh, mm -hmm. in 2022 when they played. And actually, it kind of wasn't because I think Echeverry, after winning that, he lost to um, mm -hmm. Hussler, Hussler, who had that big breakthrough then. Um, but. Um, but yeah, that 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 Mexico City semifinal I remember very well. It was like a long thriller at uh, two thousand meters altitude, of course. So very different conditions to Buenos Aires, even if it's still clay. Yeah. Jory winning over sixty percent of his second serve points in this match. Yeah, 61 second serve points. And it's it, 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 we could see it, right? Why? We yeah. could see why. Yeah, that would be the couple of moments for Stan uh, critique. But, you know, overall, I, I guess it's still a pretty good showing for him.
Like he was still very competitive, and it's you were never gonna worry that it wasn't gonna be close this match. So. So the takeaway is just Stan is where he was at last year. It's it's a good event for him, I think, yeah. as a whole. But of course, it's a painful loss as well. Like the thing is, that, like the level wise, he's right there. But yeah, in terms of actually converting these to some wins, well, it just gets harder the older you get because you know you just you just know that every single tournament that you play is like double important, especially when you're what thirty nine. I mean, Stan will be 39 in March. So. He will be 39 this year, yeah. yeah. Even in March, you say? Yeah. Funny, actually, last year I tweeted about Stan not having any success in Miami, but having success at pretty much all the other uh, big events. Mm-hmm. And he just replied with a shrug emoji. And I guess... Oh, I, I, like, think, oh I, yeah, think I think I, I, think I, think I remember that, yeah. And then I was like, I think, you know, it's your birthday on <laughs> in Miami, so you're just... And Stan is pretty active on Twitter, actually. Uh-huh. Yeah, like he he replies to stuff a lot. Like yeah, sometimes it's, it's a random tweet, really, from someone with you know ten likes, and he would reply. Yeah, <laughs> which is funny. I I like that definitely. You can see that it's really him, and you can see that you know, it's just kind of on and off there. Mm-hmm. Yes, but Damien and I, you get my very different version of watch alongs. We got. We drift into so many other topics. Yeah. <laughs> and we just nerd out. <laughs> you know, people still are still watching. We still gain subscribers so they don't lose them. <laughs> so probably yeah. someone enjoys this at least, <laughs> which is okay yes. because we, we do as well. And um, John still asks us to do this. So clearly he uh, is fine with it as well. <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder if we uh, are going to get some comments from him on the chat about this match, but probably not before we close shop, I suppose. And um, yeah, anything else left to say? Uh, Jari Echeverry, we already said that, right? In the in the quarterfinals. And he gets that 100th to level win. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. The most important stat of all. Yeah. I mean, I guess 100 wins, uh, you know. It's a nice, nice round century number, so he'll take that. I guess he, you say ninety losses, so he's like ten and nine, you know. So it sounds about right. Uh, ninety losses, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm sure it was 99, 99 to ninety before this match, yes. And he is the eighth Chilean, as I said earlier, uh, to um, to do that. Uh, Christian Garin is the only other active player yeah. and then you have some random guys in there as well of course not everyone is random just gonzalez rios masu um hans gildemeister um there's also um cello of jaime fila of course huh oh no no juan ignacio cello uh, cello is argentinian yeah, that's that's argentinian never mind cello is argentinian there's one more yeah. guy that i forgot uh it's like yeah, some random who goes 159 wins, and I don't remember his name, but okay. uh, but basically, yeah, he's the eighth. He is the second active after Christian Garin, who has 120 wins. Uh, but yeah, he's going to get more. We'll see if he gets to 200. It's going to be as meaningful as his 100, which clearly, I, I don't think he even knows it. But anyway, um, yeah, anything else left to say? Probably not, right? Thank you guys in the chat. Nope. Um, they are thanking us for our musings and nerd gifts as well uh so yeah that was that was a cool three hour stream eventually so it was actually a three hour match almost despite yeah, us saying very a few close times that it probably won't be two hours and 50 some minutes so yeah so yeah thank you guys and uh yeah i guess we'll see you on some other watch alongs and stuff bye yep bye